Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine, Sam Adams, Sam Adams, Sam Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. These men spoke up for what they thought was right. From their courage came such documents as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. From their willingness to speak what was sometimes unpopular but right, we enjoy such liberties as freedom of speech, the right to keep and bear arms, and freedom of religion. There are those who still wish to oppress our freedoms, and there are still patriots willing to stand up and defend life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Men like Zeb Bell, who honor our founding fathers and what they stood for. It's now time for Zeb at the ranch, speaking up and defending your freedoms. Brought to you by Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers and all of the other great advertisers on the program. And now, Zeb Bell. And this morning, this note comes to us from a lady in Colorado who had a slight weight problem. She said she gave up jogging for her health when her thighs kept rubbing together and setting her pantyhose on fire. Good morning, here comes Kate Smith, and God bless America! Followed by a patriot with our, pl- <laughs> our pledge. Couldn't resist it, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you very much. There goes Kate Smith, and God bless America. Good morning, everybody. I'm Zeb Bell. Zeb at the Ranch with our major corporate sponsor, your Magic Valley, Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations serving you. And, of course, some of our great advertisers like Lee's Furniture Floors and More at 459 Overland and Burley, and our friends at Western Waste Services, always at your disposal. Get on the right service today. Call them, 734-6969. And now with our for the review, here is Gina. Good morning, sunshine, and how are you? A lot better than that lady out jogging. <laughs> you're never going to catch me out jogging. It's just not my forte. You know, wouldn't that be terrible, though, if you're overweight and you have that fear of starting yourself on fire that you're running followed by a fire truck? <laughs> 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 That's just awful. <laughs> I know it is, but it's funny. <laughs> it is funny. It's very, very funny. Well, do we have a pleasure? We have uh, Mr. Carl Clark on for the pledge and Michael Rogers on for the weapon. Very good. Carl, go ahead with the pledge, please. Thank you, Zeb. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Always a good job from my dear friend. Carl, it's good to hear from you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Have a good day, sir. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, time for the weather. And the weather is brought to you by Cheney Flooring and Home Design, 1228 Oakley Avenue in Burley. Kyle and Whitney Cheney, oh my goodness, they take great pride in keeping up with the latest trends and designs. They know all about hardwoods and laminates and, of course, uh, carpet and cabinets and all the countertops. Believe me, they have a guarantee that they can meet or beat any price on flooring and they'll provide free in house consultation. Too. Call them at 678-6945. Cheney Flooring and Home Design, 1228 Oakley Avenue in Burley. Look for their blue door. Right now, here is Michael Rogers' weather. Hey, good morning, Zeb. Temperatures in Murtaugh right now in about the low 60s. You've got rain in your forecast for today, and it's going to get a cooling off period with some rain, too, so you're going to get a break. Uh, slight chance of uh, showers and thunderstorms for today and tonight. You get some rain for tomorrow, for sure. And then you'll taper off tomorrow night and sun come back out on Thursday. You got some nice weekends very towards the end of the week. Daytime highs, how about the middle 80? How about 85 for a high today? 87 for the high tomorrow. Enjoy the day, enjoy the weather, enjoy the weather you got. There you go, the world's best weatherman, brought to you this hour by our friends at Cheney Flooring and Home Design at 1228 Oakley Avenue in Burley, where they say your home design needs are aisles apart, not miles apart. Look for their blue door. Good morning, everybody. And uh, right now, 
I want to remind you, tomorrow night, Jerome County Fair team will open. Dave Zanino's putting it on. And register at 6.30 and rope at 7. And uh, that's going to be tomorrow evening at the Jerome County Fairgrounds. Don't forget that. And uh, let's see what else have we got cooking. Um, we've got a birthday in the audience that we're going to talk about in just a moment. So stay tuned for that. And Gina knows all about this one. Stay tuned. Dell's Cleaners, 1223 Albion Avenue in Burley. Oh, they are the best cleaner anywhere, anytime. I don't know who ever came up with this statement that dry cleaning shortens the life of a garment. No, it enhances it. It prolongs the life of a garment. So take your clothes in to be dry cleaned at Dell's Cleaners, 1223 Albion Avenue in Burley. Absolutely the best cleaners around anywhere. Kevin and Cindy serving you at Daryl's Cleaners in Burley. Also, our thanks go out to SafeLink Internet. By the way, they've got that special that's going until the end of this month, July 31st, where you get three for free. Free router, uh, free 30-day risk trial free, and free installation. All that, uh, the offer ends on July 31st. You better call them today. Call them at 677-8000. That number again, 677-8000. SafeLink Internet Services, the best serving you. Uh, Gina, what's this about somebody having a special birthday today? Well, there is one very special person in my life who is like my cohort in crime, my bodyguard, my babysitter, and my housekeeper all rolled up in one. And I'm talking about my older brother, Sean, and today is his actual birthday. And so today marks the day where we are no longer the same age. So to my brother, happy birthday. You are finally 43. Now grow up. <laughs> <laughs> what a slap. I mean, everything was rolling. That was really a nice, happy birthday. And then right at the end of it, you opened the trap door on the gallows and let the guy through the bottom. Oh, he knows that I love him. Besides that, he's going to get a, a very fat steak dinner tonight, and I'll even take him out for an adult beverage or two to celebrate. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and then grow up. <laughs> okay. And then grow up, brother. I love you. Hey, there you go. Happy birthday, Sean. Appreciate it. Uh, calls are welcome, 436-2244-1866-927-4587. The story this morning is amnesty. The story this morning is Obama superseding the powers that he has and with the stroke of a pen, breaking the law. The story this morning is that he's probably going to do it before Congress has a recess for the summer. And the story this morning is we don't have the jobs, we don't have the infrastructure, and this man is breaking the law. I'm calling, like a lot of people have already called, for the impeachment of Barack Hussein Obama. We absolutely cannot use this man as a dictator here in America. Call up your right with you. Stand by. Don't forget Valley Wide Home and Ranch. Fair time is here. It's here. Right now is fair time and all the 4 H's, the supplies are 10% off and they've got the best of everything you need from your brushes to your clothes to your boots to your uh, saddle blankets to your haulers to your ropes. Everything they've got right there at Valley Wide Home and Ranch. Plus they've got all the feed. Plus they've got all the Gallagher fencing. Plus they've got all your fishing supplies too. Everything you need is right Right there at Valley Wide Home and Ranch, 910 South Oneida. And Rupert, you stop in and see these good folks today. All right, good morning, caller. You're on the air. Yes, sir. Statement number one, I agree. B.O. needs to go. Uh, no doubt about that whatsoever. Now, back to something that's real important. The pantyhose, uh, <laughs> the seal carry permit would be for a fire extinguisher, not for a fire. Uh, <laughs> couldn't resist that one. Uh, I didn't get to listen to you yesterday morning, uh, but uh, there is certainly a scam going through the area, and I'm assuming it's international or whatever. Uh, I know of uh, five individuals who are on uh, Social Security who have had attempts made at getting into their Social Security, their, their uh, card accounts recently. Mm-hmm. How are they? How are they trying to do that? Well, I probably always will be. But no, no, no. Just a minute. There. How are they trying to do that? Are they calling them on the phone? Oh, okay. The the call I got. Uh, well, I got two. One Saturday and one Sunday. Uh, 
They are saying this is uh, your credit card company so-and-so. Uh, your uh, debit account is currently blocked because of uh, suspicious activities. Uh, please dial in your 16-digit uh, credit card number and we will put you in contact so you may have it reinstated. And uh, I tried to talk to them. It's a computer call. Uh, my card or my wife's card, neither one were blocked. Both of us got calls, and the other individuals have the same uh, uh, first letter in their surname. All right, so I guess the obvious reaction that I'm having is if anybody asks you for any numbers, any credit card numbers, anything over the phone, regardless of whether it's computer generated or not, just take the receiver and hang it up. Would you agree, caller? Hey, it is. I'm in agreement with you totally. All right, sir. I appreciate that, and thank you for the warning. I thank you very much for that. You know, I've said for a long time, and I... I and watch the fire extinguisher. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Have a good one. All right, sir. You know, uh, there are a lot of scams out there. And, uh, you know, all the way from, oh, we got just a little bit of paving material left and we can finish your driveway. You know, it's only going to cost you this much and everything. No. I'm going to tell you right now, these guys are nothing more than scam artists. These guys are absolutely pathetic individuals that go around looking for somebody that they can scam out of a few bucks. And uh, just ask them if they they're accredited with the Better Business Bureau. Uh, ask them who they served. You know, ask a bunch of questions, and you'll find out that they're charlatans. Uh, I just shut the door on the people after I tell them they have exactly 15 seconds to get off my property. And uh, as far as the other scam is concerned in regards to asking anything on the phone, ladies and gentlemen, don't do it. Don't give anything out. If they come across and they sound so serious and they sound so professional and they sound like that the end of the world might happen if you don't supply that information, all the more reason for you to hang up and call back to your credit card company, the number's on the card, call back to your bank, call back anywhere and verify whether or not information like that was uh, deemed to be obtained and you'll find out 99.99999 times out of 100, no way. Don't do it. Hang up the phone and walk away from the phone. These people are trying to only rip you off. Don't give them any information whatsoever. Okay? Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley. Oh my goodness, have you cleaned your air filter? Have you put a new air filter in your air conditioning unit? <gasps> Look at that! Go over to the air conditioning unit right now. Okay? Pull it out of there. Oh, how do you expect to stay cool? How do you expect that machine to work good for you? Because it's dirty! It's grimy! It's full of gunk! Well, you better get rid of it. So stop into Ramsey Heating and Electric and get a new one today. They've got everything in there. Air filters for the conditioners, rubber cord fuses. They've got it all and a lot of light bulbs too. At Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley where they provide warm winters and cool summers. Hey, by the way, we're going to be over at Denny's Restaurant this Thursday, Lunch Bunch. I had a call last night, and they said, when's Lunch Bunch? Well, it's going to be this Thursday at 1130 at Denny's Restaurant, 611 Overland in Burley. And uh, they've got gift cards. That's what I'm going to do is get some gift cards over there to uh, give to people that might be hungry and good friends, and they're looking for a great place to go eat, Denny's Restaurant. You stop in. And they've got great menu items, breakfast, lunch and dinner, and they have been so good to us for the lunch bunch. So please stop in and see them today. Denny's Restaurant, 611 Overland and Burley, absolutely the best, okay? All right, calls are welcome, 436-2244-1866-927-4587. What do you think about this president? that absolutely is uh, going to break the law and uh, 
Senator Jeff Sessions has said Congress must act immediately to stop President Obama's proposed use of executive power to help millions of illegal aliens come into this country and all of a sudden go through amnesty. He's going to send amnesty to these people. We're looking at millions of illegal aliens. That's what they are. You can flower it up any kind of verbiage you want to use. And this would be an incredible assertion of executive power vis-a-vis -vis Congress, the Alabama Republican said. In other words, this is going to be absolutely against our Constitution. Now, there are those bleeding hearts in the audience that go, Oh, gee, they're just looking for a better life. Let them all stay here. Uh-huh. This would alter the framework of the Constitution in the way that the far, our forefathers, our founders, would never have accepted. Never. Plain law says if you're in this country illegally, you're subject to deportation and you are unable to work lawfully in our country. That is the plain law of our Constitution. And this president, this criminal, that's what he is. You know, so many people are afraid to call him what he is. He is a criminal that's going against the law. It's his job as president to enforce the laws passed by Congress. And this man is a criminal. This man is subverting the Constitution. This man is absolutely skirting around the law in Congress. And he needs to be impeached. Now, I know there's scoffers out there in the audience that think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. How and why do you think that? When we have dictatorial powers coming from this man, and he absolutely is a criminal. Caller, I'll be right there. Don't go away. Don't forget our friends at Barry Equipment and Rental. Oh, my goodness. Three locations serving you, and I mean service is the key word, in Twin Falls on Addison Avenue, in Jerome, South Lincoln, and in Burley, that new location at 159 West Highway 30 in Burley. And they've got everything. They've got everything. They've got a shop with certified mechanics, and they've got all the construction equipment, the man lifts, the skid steers, excavators, all the bobcat equipment. They've got the Doosan loaders. What are you waiting for? This is the place to go to get the work done. Barry Equipment and Rental in Twin Falls, Jerome, and 159 West Highway 30 in Burley. Absolutely great people. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning, Fab. Yes, sir. What good does it do to pass the law if he's on side by it? That's right. You know, a good example is Congress had passed a law that said they had to notify, the president had to notify Congress 30 days before he got one of these war monitors go. And he did not do that. So what are we going to do for that? I don't know, but I want to see the man impeached. I want to see the man brought up on charges. I want to see the man, anything that we can do to go after Obama. I don't like him. I detest the man. I hate his ideology. I do. And uh, it has nothing to do with race. I have never liked this man. I don't trust him. What more can I say? I want to see him brought up on criminal charges against the United States and its people and the Constitution. That's absolutely right. He, he he thinks he has power to do anything, and he is a dictator. Well, uh, he's turned... It, what has he got to lose? He knows that people aren't going to do anything to him. He knows that he's in a lame duck situation uh, for the next two years. He knows that he's got uh, the Senate. He knows that uh, he doesn't care anymore. He knows that he says he has the power of the phone and the pen. I'm telling you, Keith, I'm scared of this man. Well, the thing that scares me is the fact that no one in his cabinet or even works close to with him has anything to worry about. Lewis Lerner has nothing to worry about because if they do charge her with uh, contempt of Congress or whatever, he will pardon her. 
You know, and there was something said last night on the news that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it was said by Andrew McCarthy, and I've had him on my program. And uh, he was talking about a special appointment of a special prosecutor, and he said no, because that prosecutor probably would be jaded by uh, the Department of Justice and Eric Holder and probably have some arm twisting behind the scenes. He says to let things go the way they are with Congress and public opinion and uh, do it that way instead of a special prosecutor because he doesn't trust the special prosecutor. You know, and another thing I see on the news, undocumented workers are at the White House yeah. demonstrating against I don't know if they're demonstrating against the fact that they can't get a job. No, no. The main portion. They round them all up. Yeah, the main reason these undo. Let's don't call them that, Keith. Be honest about it. These are illegal aliens. Illegal here in this country. Aliens that are not native to our country and they're not citizens. Therefore, the terminology is just illegal aliens. They are saying that their rights are violated. What in the world rights do they have as illegal aliens? I want you to tell me that. I don't even think they have the right to walk the streets of the United States because they're not legal. All right, if you did the same thing they're doing over in France or Great Britain or Japan or whatever, please tell me what you think might happen to you. Well, you get put in jail, probably not get fed. You know, there's a lot of penalties for people who commit crimes in other countries. That's right. And I think it's about high time, it's about high time that this country, the United States of America, started acting like the big boy that it used to be, pulled their pants up, and start acting in a manner that we're not going to take this abuse anymore. I'm fed up with it. There is one good thing that's happening now. You know, these people are in these small cells. Now they've got to uh, warm out of TV give them a little more room. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm more worried. I'm really worried about their room. Keith, thank you so much. Appreciate your call this morning. Appreciate it. Call back. Thanks. I want to tell everybody about Snyder Surplus. It's not just Army and hunting supplies. They've got something for everybody. I mean, really. Uh, this is a brand new store. Brand new store after that devastating fire. And brand new merchandise, but the same friendly service they've always had. These are wonderful wonderful people. Everything from office chars to uh, office jars. Office chairs. I don't know why I said jars. Office chairs all the way to rifles. I mean, my goodness sakes, they've got everything. At 112 South, 200 West of Rupert. All you have to do is stop in and say hello. And that's Snyder Surplus. Wonderful folks serving you. You stop in and see them today. Call her real quick. I've got a hard break at the bottom of the hour. Go ahead, please. I'll be quick, Zeb. Uh, I just, uh, me and my friends and everybody are so upset about this, uh, these illegal aliens coming in here, and what, what in the hell is going on? These, our legislators, they got to stop it. I, I'm frustrated too, and believe me, I don't know, I'm not acting facetious, and I'm not trying to act vague on this, and I'm not some uh, ditzy talk show host that's going to sit there and says he has all the answers, because nobody does. I don't know. All I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Crapo, I'm going to tell Rich, I'm going to tell Simpson, I don't like this, I don't like the way that you're managing your time and efforts back there in Washington, you are not helping honor our Constitution and our laws. This man, Obama, is breaking the law. He's a criminal with a pen and a phone that absolutely is superseding what the Constitution says. What more can I say here on the radio this morning? No, that, that's the best you can do. And if, I just will keep my mouth shut other than talk to you or somebody because, you know, I'm out here on the poor farm and yeah, but Ray, honestly, it takes people like you and I and everybody else to get upset about it. I'm going to do all I can. After this program is over, I intend to call Crapo's office and Rish's office and Simpson's and Labrador and some of the others around the state or the United States that I know very well. And I'm going to tell them this is absolute incompetency that you're allowing the President of the United States to supersede the powers that he has, act 
is a dictator, almost like somebody in Venezuela or Bolivia or whatever, and he's absolutely leading America by the nose to do just what he wants on his own ideology. The man should be impeached. He should have criminal charges filed against him because he's a crook. I sure agree with you, and I, but this this deal is beyond comprehension, and that's all there is to it. I agree with you, and it's good to hear you call in. Thank you for your voice. I appreciate it. You bet. All right. Have a good day. Um, I don't think we've had the Capitol Press Ag Minute. I forgot, and we're running late, so here's the Capitol Press Ag Minute. I'll be right back. Today's Ag Minute brought to you by the Capitol Press, the West Ag Weekly. USDA's mid-year inventory of all cattle and calves in the U.S. on July 1st at 95 million head is down 3% from July 1st, 2012, and the lowest July 1st inventory since the USDA series began in 1973. Because of the federal budget sequestration, the USDA didn't survey or report numbers for July 1st, 2013, but the overall inventory and a slight increase in dairy cows is no surprise, says Daryl Peel, livestock marketing specialist with Oklahoma State University. Steers 500 pounds and over are down 4%, calves under 500 pounds are down 3%, and the calf crop down 2% from July 1st, 2012. For the Capital Plus Ag Minute, this is Brandon Penner. For more agriculture news and information, turn to the West Ag Weekly, the Capital Press, and CapitalPress.com. No, thank you very much, Capital Press. Great newspaper. I get a lot of my material out of that paper, and I appreciate them. Uh, Pacific Steel and Recycling, 320 West Main and Burley, 678-2321. If you've got old implements and you want them out of your yard, Pacific Steel and Recycling will come and get them for you. The same as old and used appliances, computers, drop them off, and I'll tell you what, get rid of them. Great guys to work with at Pacific Steel and Recycling, 320 West Main in Burley, and they're one of our Burley merchants celebrating the Cache County Fair and Pro Rodeo, along with Pickett Equipment Company at 976 East Main Street in Burley. I know these folks, and they are cream of the crop. You better believe it for your bean equipment, the Twin Master Edible Bean Combine, Double Master Plus Side Pull Combine. They are the best, and they deserve the accolades. Pickett Equipment Company, 678-0855. Celebrating the Cache County Fair and Pro Rodeo. Calls are welcome and appreciated. 436 224 You know, I look at this situation with Obama, and I read all about Jeff Sessions and many others that are upset about what he's doing, but nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody is getting on television, whether it's ABC, CBS, or NBC, and they're not saying the man's a crook. They're not ma saying the man's exceeded and superseded his powers as president. They're not saying anything about what a phony, phony administration this is. Look at Obamacare. Now they want to rechange and retool and rewrite certain aspects of Obamacare that are only going to listen carefully only going to benefit federal workers, but, but, the caveat is, everybody, you and me and everybody else has to pay for it. Once again, only going to benefit federal workers, but you and I have to pay for it. What? This is not legal. This is not right. The president can't do that. He can't rewrite the law. And the rest of us sit here like Obama is some kind of a shrine. Obama is some kind of an irreproachable person or figurehead that we can't say anything bad about. Because we've got liberal loons in the audience here and everywhere. Oh, oh, he's the president. Why, we must not. No, we don't have to honor him. He's a crook. He's a criminal. And he's proved it. You can go with when he had the interview with Bill O'Reilly. Now, whether you like O'Reilly or not, I don't. Still in the interview, when it was asked about the IRS and corruption, not a smidgen. Those are the president's words, not mine. This is a tumultuous mess with the IRS. Look at Obamacare, a tumultuous mess. Look at Benghazi, 
a tumultuous mess. Look at this border situation, a tumultuous mess that keeps getting enhanced every day, and now he wants to have amnesty for these people? You know, think about Boise, Idaho, and the population up there ten times over. That's how many people he wants to go ahead and give amnesty to. Where are they going to live? What about the infrastructure? What about the jobs? What about, yep, they're going to be on welfare. You and I are paying for it. You want to absorb that? I don't. Calls are welcome, 436-224-1866-927-4587. I just can't imagine what's going on in the minds of Americans today. You know, legal immigrants that have come here and they, they by the sweat of their uh, brow and the blood, sweat, and tears that they provided to become Americans, they, they're mad. They're really upset and they're mad because, and rightfully so, so they should be. They did everything legal and they came to this country and they were a motivating force for betterment. These people, these illegal aliens, what have they done? What have they done to create a better America? Sugar bee growers, may I have your attention please? Introducing Preaxor from BASF, the newest form of chemistry for sugar beets to fight disease and potentially increase yield and sugar content of your sugar beets. Preaxor contains headline and a new compound called Xenium that also provides excellent control of powdery mildew. Now, like I said, with the application of BASF's Preaxor 45 to 60 days prior to harvest, you have the potential of higher yields and more sugar content in your sugar beets. Well, you better contact your local Ag Chem supplier today. And for more information, call BASF Ron Ellis at 431-6776 or Tim Perry at 844-0682. BASF's Preaxor for your better sugar beets. You know what's amazing to me? is that most of you aren't outraged. Most of you aren't just standing there beating spatulas onto the back of tin pans mad in the streets. This is affecting you. This is taking away from our programs of Social Security and other programs and will diminish the value of what Americans have paid for and paid into. Why aren't you upset? Why aren't you upset? We have a little good news this morning that I want to highlight and I want to brag about a little bit. And that is a federal judge in New York City has ruled. Now listen closely to this. He has ruled that that iron cross, remember that piece of metal, that uh, sheared off piece of metal framework from one of the buildings of the Twin Towers that looked just like a cross. Remember that cross that's been in the news from 911? And uh, right off the bat, the atheists came out of the woodwork and they said, why? That's got to be removed from the 911 memorial. Why? It's a Christian symbol. Why? You can't have it here. Well, the judge said, no. No, yesterday he ruled, and he said basically to the atheists, hit the road, Jack, and don't come back no more. That cross is going to stay, not for the religious reasons that you might think, but the cross is going to stay because it is a part of what happened on 911 and deserves to be a remnant right there during any ceremony or observed through the 911 memorial. So, the atheists have got their tails stuck between their legs and they're scurrying like rats into other corners because they lost this one. They lost this one big time and I'm happy about that. Uh, yes, the Iron Cross is going to stay. And I have talked to many, many people, including a very good friend of mine that lives back there, that has been there to see that memorial and watch and, and just kind of uh, revel, revel at the absolute uh, sincerity of the event and sincerity of what they put together back there. And he said it's absolutely awesome. And so to the judge that ruled in favor of keeping the Iron Cross there, way to go. And to the atheists, too bad. 
calls are welcome, 436-2244-1866-927-4587. Hey, by the way, Sophie's Chatterbox at 530 East Street on the Square in Rupert. Are you familiar with this place to eat? Well, you should be. You can't find a better place for breakfast, lunch, or supper Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., Saturdays and Sundays, 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And they've got a bakery there that makes wedding cakes, cookie bars, homemade bread, and delicious cinnamon rolls. And that's exactly what she's doing for us is delivering cinnamon rolls to a lot of our sponsors. I appreciate what she does. Sophie's Shatterbox, 530 East Street on the Square in Rupert. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Good morning, Zeb. Yes, sir. Are you going to have crepe on? you think you need time soon? I'm hoping tomorrow morning if everything goes according to the schedule. Good. The first thing I'd like you to ask him is when he takes and puts his vote in for these so-called uh, Secretary of Treasures and all that stuff, Secretary of State, does he really stop and think what in the hell he's doing? Well, Al, when you say that, does he stop and think what he's doing? What are you referring to? I mean, what mistake did he make on his vote, or what are you saying? Well, I want to know if he's like the rest of them, just going along with the good old boys because he used to be a senator, or is he really thinking that old uh, Kerry's doing a good job? That's what I'm trying to get at. I don't see how anybody, and I'm glad you brought this up, and I will hold his feet to the fire on this. Uh, John Kerry is an absolute joke. John Kerry is being laughed at. John Kerry is going against our number one ally in that area, Israel. John Kerry has designed a peace plan that will never be accepted, and the peace plan favors Hamas, a terrorist group, over our ally. This is so repugnant. And it goes right along with this Obama administration. I don't trust them, I don't like them, and I want to see them impeached. Well, I know I do too, but as long as you got older and Harry Reid in there, you're not going to get a damn thing done because there's no guts in the Senate of this United States. They're all gutless. And I tell you what, I think the whole bunch should be kicked clear out of office and let's start over again. Al, I don't be offended when I say this to you, but you know as well as I do that that is wishful thinking and won't happen. We have to deal with reality. We have to deal with the hopeful opportunity that the Senate will go GOP in November. We've got to strive for that. That's the only hope right now that we have. I know it, and that's why I'm just, I'm just disgusted the way things are going because Israel has been our friend's for years, they backed us in everything that we've ever had to do. And then Kerry goes over there and does what he does. For hell's sakes, call him back here and ground his aircraft and say, shut up and go on. Well, okay, let, let me ask you this. You know, here we have uh, the uh, confines of Israel right in the middle of all this thuggery and all this killing and all this mayhem. Here we have Hamas that is an avowed terrorist organization. And John Kerry, our Secretary of State, is actually drawing up a peace plan that uh, would favor them over our ally. I mean, how much more does Israel have to take from this administration? I know, because he no more said that and got it out of his mouth till Hamas started throwing rockets across the damn border again. There you go. How much does Israel have to take before they stand up and say, enough's enough, we took Egypt in six days, if you want it, you're going to get it in three. You know, and, and here's the way I feel about Israel, and you might not be as this uh, kind of bulldog attitude, but I wish this morning, right now this morning, which six hours later over in uh, Israel, it's uh, going on middle afternoon, I wish they'd throw everything they could at Hamas to destroy their tunnels, to destroy their military infrastructure. I mean, just literally kill Hamas off. I don't care. I want to see them obliterated. Then I would like them, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and others, to call Washington, D.C. and get Obama on the line and say, there, we don't need you. We're going to take care of this matter ourselves. Now you come pick up the pieces. That's right, and then I'd stop the funding for all them Palestinians and the whole damn bunch because we're just throwing money after bad because everybody we've tried to help over there has turned around and stuck the knife in our back, and we're too damn stupid to do anything about it. I agree. Couldn't have said it any better. Al, thank you. God bless. Have a good one. Appreciate it, sir. Uh, yeah, I wish that Israel just turned it loose. 
just say, hey, you, you've cost us all kinds of problems. We'll sit back. We're not doing anything. And you keep lobbing these missiles and bombs at us and everything. Not enough is enough. We're not going to play with you anymore like a cat to a mouse. We're going to absolutely... We're going to just destroy you once and for all. Your military infrastructure, all your tunnels, all your tunnel rats, all your people coming in and trying to blow us up and kill our kids and everything. We've had enough of you. You're gone. You're gone. Time for the weather. Brought to you by Burley Glass, 1029 Overland Avenue in Burley. General Ben, Leslie, the whole crew. You know, you ought to consider installing vinyl windows in your home. They can increase the energy efficiency of your home by two to three times. And the windows they put in my office are absolutely, we love these windows. And that is not just a flippant remark. It's the way it is. I, honestly, they have helped our home so much. Energy efficiency, A1. You better believe it. Burley Glass, 1029. Overland Avenue in Burley, and here now, Michael Rogers Weather. Not the cow, but Michael. Temperatures in Murtaugh right now in about the low 60s. You've got rain in your forecast for today, and it's going to get a cooling off period with some rain, too, so you're going to get a break. Uh, slight chance of uh, showers and thunderstorms for today and tonight. You get some rain for tomorrow, for sure. And then you'll take it off tomorrow night and some come back out on Thursday. you got to do a nice weekend. You work very towards the end of the week. Based on highs, how about the middle 80? How about 85 for a high today? 87 for the high tomorrow. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the weather. Enjoy the weather you've got. Thank you, Michael. Brought to you by Burley Glass, 1029 Overland Avenue in Burley. Now, Gina, i got to confess, I'm a little bit confused. No, there's not a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should have heard me laughing when I'm like, oh, oh no. Yeah, I can imagine a, a laugh and then probably a word of disdain. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you know, I think I need to move those two particular buttons, like, apart from each other. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, folks, don't forget the Jerome County Fair and rodeo coming up in Jerome at Jerome County Fairgrounds August 5 through 9. I'll tell you what, they usually get over 30,000 fairgoers annually. A full week of activity from the PRCA rodeo all the way to the really upbeat lawnmower races along with a huge, huge parade. Pig wrestling extraordinaire. I mean, it's a lot of fun at your Jerome County Fair and rodeo August 5th through the 9th in Jerome. Don't you miss it. Going to be good. Going to be good. All right, give us a call, 436-2244-1-866-927-4587. Hey, Gina, i got to talk this story over with you just a little bit. Okay. You know right. quite a bit about sports. I mean, you played sports and everything. Yes. Yeah. And you know how valuable it is for the home team to have a good crowd in the stands that's yelling and oh. cheering and really giving you the encouragement to go out and play well, right? Oh, it, it can make or break a game. All right. Well, we got a little problem over in South Korea with one of their baseball teams. Oh? Yeah. The Wahan Eagles are not playing very well. As a matter of fact, over the last couple of years, they have lost over. Now, listen to this. In the last couple of years, they have lost over 400 games. Out. They're not playing well at all, and people are not buying tickets to go to the game. So the Wahan Eagles, they have taken to another resort. As to not having people in the seats, they have installed robots and painted faces on the robots, and they are cheering for the home team. Is it working? Um, they're still losing. <laughs> Badly. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's that's sad. You really do. Wow. You know, really, how would you like to? Really, how would you like to run out on the field? Here's here's the the announcer, and playing right field. Here we are, Gina Jameson, and you run out on the field, and all of a sudden you look up in the stands, and there's nothing but robots uh, being controlled by roboticized movements, and they're clapping their hands and nodding their roboticized faces with a smile that's painted on. What would that make you feel like? It would be very disheartening. You know, honestly, it would be kind of a, a, a blow to the pride uh, because there's, you want real bodies there. You don't want a robot. You, 
a robot is pre-programmed. A, a person is is actual human emotion and sponta- uh, being spontaneous. And so it would be disheartening. From I, I tell you what, there's been a couple of pro football teams over the years that would have begged for having some robots. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Seattle used to be one of them. Yeah, and you know who else? And that was the New Orleans Saints. Remember that when they used yeah. to wear bags over their heads and everything? Yeah. 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 But they turn the teams around, and so and now they, they sell out stadiums every game. But oh, oh, robots. Oh. It, but it's really, I just couldn't believe it when I saw this story this morning. I mean, I can just see the manager in the clubhouse before the game. All right, guys, we're going to give it our best. We got so-and-so pitching today, and we're going to go out, and we're going to really win one for the Gipper. And they take the field, and there's nothing but robots sitting in the seats. Oh, come on. That'd be worse than George Orwell's 1984. That would be the only way I, you could probably get me to play is if I could take one of those robots home and make it clean my house or work on my car. There you go. All right. Yeah. Calls are welcome. 436 224 You know, there's another situation in the world. Gina, I'm going to have you stay on the air for a minute. Uh, you ought to be very concerned about it. And you know what it is? It's the Ebola virus. Have you heard about this? I've heard about it, yes. Okay, the Ebola virus in Africa, that's where the main strain of this virus is centered, is mm-hmm. extremely deadly. And there's just less than, I think, 5% of the people that contract it live. I mean, it's it's just, basically, it's a death wish. And once you get it, you almost pray to die because you're so sick. Well, now, and this is what's really eerie, now they're finding out that people that have been infected with the virus are getting on airplanes and flying around the world and now they're really concerned that the Ebola virus may be coming to a town near us here in the United States. Well, have, why haven't these people been checked? Why are they flying in the first place? Well, see, this is the thing I don't understand is how in the world is it going to result in testing in these various areas like over in Africa, etc. Uh, before you buy a plane ticket, are you going to have to have your blood tested? Or are you going to be able to uh, get on a plane without having a certificate of health to fly anywhere or sit in confined quarters on an airliner with other people? I mean, now, if it's all over the world and possibly being spread by people that are getting on airplanes, this could be a world health nightmare. Yeah, this could be a, 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 a massive pandemic of epic proportions. You know, they don't get that. I mean, th- these people shouldn't even be flying. Shouldn't they be quarantined? Yeah, and, and remember that movie that came out not too long ago? It was called The Last Ship. Remember that? Yes. And it was basically about a uh, pandemic that went around the globe, uh, and these people on the ship were the last resort, the last humans, etc. I'm not going to go into it any further than that. But think about it. Sometimes uh, fiction actually imitates real life. Well, now this is reverse, and, and this Ebola virus is really, really serious. It's absolutely deadly. And a man that just gets on an airplane with close contact with other people might spread it all over the world. Once they get the uh, spread of the virus, somebody else is going to come in contact with the virus. And you know, it wouldn't be very long at all before it could be coming to Boise, Idaho, or anywhere else. You would never know. And so, uh, so what is our government, what are, you know, the transportation people doing about this to, you know, say, hey, okay, if you're sick, then you can't fly. what are they doing? That's a good question. And that's a question that most of the people looking at this are asking is, number one, what about constraints? What about restraints? What about absolutely confinement? What, what are we going to do to make sure that people that are flying out of that area are not uh, with the virus? They know now that one man was, and he got on an airliner with the virus, and he had close uh, contact with many, many people. And Lord only knows where they're going to end up. It could be Amsterdam. It could have been Great Britain, it could have been uh, Tokyo, it could have been New York City. You never know. Never know. It's very, very so, scary. Very, very scary. And wasn't it that uh, one of the doctors that was actually over there in Africa, he was like head research and and uh, very pivotal doctor with uh, the Ebola virus and that he actually contracted yep. the disease now too? Yep. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, there's been a couple of American doctors, and it is honestly, and I'm not uh, trying to sound theatrical, it is a death wish. It's absolutely a terrible virus, and very, very small rate of living through it, and I'm just really concerned as to the incompetency and the idiocy of people flying uh, that have been exposed to the virus, and look at the residual effect. I mean, you go to Great Britain, and one person uh, is in close contact with six, six begets 30, 30 begets 300. I mean, my goodness, this could be a worldwide epidemic. One person with the disease hops onto a subway system. Yeah. That's all it takes. Yeah. I mean, this is spooky. I got to pay some bills. I got to pay some bills. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And don't forget your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers. All seven locations serving you. Mm hmm. Free tire value promise, free peace of mind tire protection, free lifetime tire mileage care. These people are the best. Absolutely the best. They've got the best in tires. You know that. They've got all the tread designs that you need. They've got absolutely the best in brake service. The best. The best in front end alignment, shocks and struts, batteries, you name it. But, you know, I want to go back to that word, service. The best in service. You just go in there and they take care of you and your car. Please stop in today and see Lane and Rupert, Dave on Blue Lakes and Twin Falls, Mike and Buell, Mike and Jerome, the Twist family and Paul, John on Poline and Twin Falls, and Randy on Overland and Burley, the best. Your Magic Valley, Les Schwab Tire Centers. Whew, busy morning. And uh, let's see what else is coming up today. Next hour, we're going to be talking to one of my dear, dear friends, Dave Beagle, out of Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, we're going to be talking to him about what's going on in the fast food industry with their demands, their demands for $15 an hour and being led by the SEIU union, and Dave knows all about them. He had to fight them, and uh, we're going to have him on the air. Then at 9.30, we're going to take a walk on in history. We'll just say that on the Oregon Trail. And we're going to have with us Michelle Matthews from the Times News talking about history in this area. And then Dr. History at 10.06. And then we're going to talk energy with coal with Daniel Simmons at 10.30. Don't go away. I will be back in six minutes. Zeb at the ranch. Uh, good morning. Welcome back. Hour number two. Zeb at the Ranch on a Tuesday, July 29th already. Hard to believe July is almost a memory. And get ready for August. Holy smokes. Anyway, um, we are brought to you by our major corporate sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers. All seven locations serving you. And then also some of our great advertisers, which include Lease Furniture Floors and More at 459 Overland and Burley, and our friends at Western Waste Services. From the canyons of the Snake River and the La Crosse Southern Idaho, we're always in You know, really, they've got everything that they are always at your disposal, whether it's the uh, portable restrooms or whether, of course, you need a dumpster in various sizes, uh, the minis, the portable storage units. I'm telling you what, uh, great, great, great service on anything and everything you need always at your disposal. Western Way Services, all you have to do is call 734-6969. And you know, with all the parties and the reunions, everything, Maybe a picnic. You better check on those porta potties. They've got them all ready for you. 734 6969. Western Way Services serving you and your family. By the way, every Thursday at 912, we have a program called Gardening for Idiots. Yes, it's named after me. And I am getting better, though, at my gardening and uh, the pursuit of my gardening wares. Anyway, Vicky's Country Garden brings us the show at 185 South, 600 West of Paul. Number to call, 438-5663. And we'll talk about everything from gardening all the way to landscaping. Vicky's Country Garden on the Burley Paul Highway.
And let's not forget some folks that have been so supportive of this program and so supportive of the community, and that's, of course, our friends at Hanson Mortuary, 710 6th Street in Rupert with Joel Heward, the manager, and his family serving your family. That's right. And it, maybe you can't make it in to talk about arrangements. Well, they will come to you. Maybe you just are so busy with everything you're trying to put together and dot all the I's and cross all the T's. And he knows, he understands, and Joel Heward will be there to serve you. Absolutely. With the highest ethical standards, with unquestioned integrity. Please call them today. Handsome Mortuary at 710 6th Street in Rupert, 436 5 that number again, 436-5636. Well, let's go to the phone lines right now. A very, very dear friend of mine back in Indianapolis, Indiana, and that, of course, is the one, the only, Dave Bego. Good morning, David. How are you? I'm doing great, Ted. How are you doing? Well, David, of course, is the author of The Devil at My Doorstep, The Devil at Our Doorstep, and has a great blog, and uh, nobody knows more about uh, the sinister effects, if you will, of unions and what they will do behind the scenes or under the table. And Dave, right now I've got three or four different articles right here in my hand, from the Wall Street Journal, Journal USA Today, our local paper. Uh, some of the headlines read, Fast Food workers prepare to escalate wage demands, and then another headline reads, fast food workers vow civil disobedience. Dave, I'm fed up with this. I, I really am sick and tired of these people that are at entry-level jobs, basically holding the rest of us hostage and demanding $15 an hour, and they're supported by the SEIU. I'll let you pick up the story from there. Well, actually, Zeb, uh, they they were <laughs> they were corralled and uh, herded by the SEIU. Uh, if if these people had never been approached uh, by the organizers of the SEIU, you'd never hear about this. But uh, it's just like they uh, when they came after my company uh, and our on our commute and our people, excuse me, um, they go out and they're very adept at finding people who are easily misguided or misinformed, naive, you know, however you want to label it, and uh, feeding these people uh, this stuff that, uh, you know, yeah, I'm, we're going to get you double your wages and, and all this stuff, and uh, then they get these people out on the streets doing this stuff, and uh, it's just a, it's another version of the corporate campaign that the SIU ran against my company and commercial cleaning companies across the Midwest several years ago, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, it really just shows you what this union and the labor bosses that, to run this union are all about. Uh, they don't really care about these people because they don't tell them, you know, what the downside of all this is, is that, you know, uh, obviously the food's going to cost more, but, uh, you know, probably half of them are going to lose their jobs. They're all going to be part-time employees. There will be no benefits and all that. And, uh, but the bottom line is, the SEIU and the other unions are desperate, and they are doing these type of things all over the country to stir up people, um, and uh, they know that they can count on the misinformed. You know, Dave, let's elaborate on this point just a little bit. They know that they can count on the misinformed, your last couple of words in that sentence. Don't these people understand that by demanding a $15 an hour minimum wage at a McDonald's or Wendy's or a whatever pizza hut, you know, don't they realize that inflation is going to run rampant? Don't they realize that their jobs might be in jeopardy? Don't they realize that part-time help might be of essence? Don't they realize that maybe even uh, mechanization might uh, take over some of the jobs that humans have? Don't they realize this? And if not, why not? Well, no, they don't, because um, unfortunately in this country, Zeb, and I've been a promote, proponent in talking to high schools and colleges around the Midwest here, that one thing that we don't teach in our schools very well, uh, and, and we should have mandatory classes in this like we do in, the, you know, in English and algebra and you know stuff like that, is we should have mandatory uh, classes in business so that people understand how business works. Because you know, a lot of these people can't even balance their own checkbook, let alone understand how a business has to work, you know, how it uh, has to count for its cost, how it has to make a, a margin, 
and at the end of the day make a profit. But it's not even about that. It's about cash flow, having enough cash coming in to pay the bills on time and to make investments to grow or take care of uh, new, new technology or whatever it may be. And these people have no clue, and, and our country has no clue as a, as a general perspective. And uh, these people, um, unless the company goes out and talks to them like we did when the SIU attacked me and sit down and go over this with them and explain it to them in detail, uh, they really don't, they, they don't even think about it. But once you talk to them, here's the interesting thing. When you talk to them and go through it a little bit, they're not stupid people. They get it. And when you do this, what you do is, is you, you know, short circuit the SEIU's campaigns, and that's one of the ways we did it. Uh, I think I told this story before. We had a gal in Cincinnati. Um, I went around to all of our facilities that were under attack, and uh, there was about 50 employees in the room, and I, I started talking about this. And this lady, uh, she was a mid-50s black lady, stood up, she says, may I speak? And I said, sure. And I had no idea what she was going to say. You know, I was taking a chance. And she stood up and she looked around the room and she said, you know, we might make double our wages in some place like New York, but the cost of living is twice as much, too. This company pays us fairly. We have benefits. They make sure we're safe. We've got good chemicals and equipment. They're nice people. We need to support our uh, company. Everybody in the room, except two people, stood up and cheered. Wow. So there's 40 or 50 people in the room. So most of them get it but they have to be exposed a little bit, and it has to be brought to their attention. Dave, there's, there's a couple of groups of people in this country that I think it's going to affect the worst, and that's the entry level for teenagers uh, trying to make it through a summer, hopefully they uh, garner enough money to go to college. Uh, I think it's going to hurt the workforce as far as not having these low-level entry jobs. I think we're going to see much more unemployment. We're going to see inflation run rampant. I do not see, unless I'm missing something, any good residual effects from raising the minimum wage up to $15 for a burger flipper. I must not be seeing something that the Democrats and the Liberals and the SEIU is seeing and promoting. Well, there, there isn't, and that's the short answer. But the reason they're doing this, Zeb, and particularly now, and I've, again, I think I've mentioned this before in the, in the last several months, um, this is all part of the strategy for the, uh, uh, the 2014 November elections coming up. And they're putting this stuff out there because it's just it's just like the SEIU trying to get people to join the union. Uh, the Democrats and the unions and this administration are pandering for votes for November. And that's pure and simple. That's all it is. You know, and uh, they think that, uh, and, and rightfully so, that a lot of people will think, oh, that sounds good. Yeah. You know, if they're going to do these things, uh, and this is what they're going to push, uh, if we can keep them the majority in the Senate, yeah, we need to vote for these people. Yeah. Um, but here's, here's the sad side that people don't realize and understand that these people, the president, the union, and the Democrats are hypocritical. You know, on the other side of the issue, uh, yeah, they're pushing for, um, you know, an increase in minimum wage, but on the other side of the issue, they're letting people come across the border, and Zeb, it's not just kids, I can tell you. Uh, it's adults who need jobs. And these jobs, these people are going out, and we have companies out there that are hiring them um, as independent contractors. And, you know, they're illegal. They're not documented workers. And they're paying them under the table uh, piecework. So they may, at the end of a week, uh, they're not making minimum wage, probably much less than minimum wage. They don't get any overtime. There's no benefits. And the company that they uh, work for is not paying any payroll taxes, you know, FICA, FUTA, SUTA, or anything like that. And there's no ta income taxes taken out. And uh, this is artificially lowering the wages across this country and reducing jobs for Americans. So they're talking out of both sides of the mouth. We've got to help connect the dots for the American people. You know, when we say we've got to connect the dots with the American people, you know, belong, don't they understand that belonging to a union, i.e. the SEIU, that's not exactly, exactly a free glory ride either, is it? No, it isn't, and, and a lot of the union people are waking up to this. It's like the gal in my book, Mary, Mary on the Mighty, Mary uh, Nojum. You know, she has got a lawsuit out in California against the SEIU. She's a member because she works for the state. 
and uh, she also during June, you know, had a, um, a big campaign for people to sign a non-germane statement that will uh, 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 keep the SEIU from taking out uh, dues money for politics and campaigns and stuff like that. And she had, what I hear, pretty good success. Maybe 40% of the people in her local signed up, and they're going to have their dues reduced by 34% because of it. Mm. Dave, uh, I would be amiss if I didn't get into another subject this morning, and it's Obama and possibly with the stroke of his pen and the use of his phone superseding the Constitution and just basically saying he's going to thumb his nose at the law and sign amnesty possibly for millions of illegal aliens that are already in this country. I'm just, I sat here the first hour and I was appalled that this man is not up on impeachment charges, that this man is not subject to criminal charges, he is not a one-man band. He is supposed to enforce the laws that Congress passes, and yet he's trying to rewrite and establish his own as a dictator. Am I too harsh? No, no, I think you're right. I think that's his ultimate objective, and he doesn't care about this country. It's just like, yeah, and I've had uh, union employees tell me this, like Marion and uh, some uh, United Auto Workers in Michigan who uh, got right to work past this, uh, they realize the big labor bosses don't care about them at all. And all the st stuff they say and do is uh, for their own purposes and, uh, you know, pandering for votes. You know, and they'll tell people what they want to hear so that they can get the votes they need to, to uh, get things done, while in the background they're substituting um, the nation and uh, the membership of the unions and people like that. Um, and I think this president, he says whatever he wants to say, you know, like uh, amnesty, again, that's for votes. And uh, the other part is, we've talked about this before, is putting such a economic burden on this country that he brings down the economy and tries to take over as a dictator. Okay, now, when we say that, a lot of people are going, oh, those right-wing nuts, my goodness sakes, that'll never happen. But, you know, it's right there. Dave, it's lurking out in the hallway. It's ready to creep under the door. I don't know why America can't see the uh, transition of power and how it uh, relates back to Obama in really a uh, very subversive, subversive type of power that this administration wants to take over with total power and control over over everything, especially our Constitution and our government. You don't hear congressmen and senators standing up and railing against him. And that's one of my main questions. Why aren't there more people forming groups and having public outcries against this president? Because they all believe uh, that he can't do it, that it can't happen, and that, um, you know, as far as impeachment, uh, that ain't going to happen because they don't control the Senate and, uh, you know, that it's not worth the time for that. And my response to that is, is that when you have a bully attacking you, you have to stand up and punch the bully in the nose, just like we did with the SEIU. And one of the ways you do that is you keep them, you go on the offensive and you keep them so busy, um, you know, uh, fending off your challenges, whether it's impeachment or a lawsuit or whatever it may be, that uh, they don't have time to institute uh, the things that they want to do. And once you get them in that mode, it's much easier to roll things back. And you just can't, it's hard, I, for some reason, good, but they just don't want to hear it. You know, i got to also ask you about this. You're a man that keeps up on all the affairs of what's going on in government. Here we have our number one ally in the Middle East, and that's Israel. And they've been a friend to us. We have been a friend to them uh, for time immortal. However, right now, under the auspices of John Kerry as Secretary of State, he's actually undermining and basically trying to bury any kind of friendship that we've had with Israel over the years and show more sympathy and show more giving and condescending to Hamas, a terror group, than he is with Israel. What kind of idiocy is going on here? Well, uh, it, it's obvious that this administration believes that we should be friends with everybody and that we should reach out and 
there shouldn't be any war and uh, we should be friends with Hamas and everybody else and you know the, um, a lot of people want, think that comes from the president's uh, background and that um, but I, I think it's just another instance of um, you know uh, more pressure to top our government and bring it down and uh, so you know it's not whether they really care about um, um, Israel or Hamas or that. It's it's putting the United States in a position where we no longer have power. And you know, again, uh, the, the government finally topples, and uh, they're in a position to take over. Dave, I want to end the program by asking about something completely removed from some of the stuff we've talked about on the telephone. And uh, you, of course, back in Indianapolis, Indiana, with the uh, football team, the Indianapolis Colts, a fine football team, and they had a great coach, I thought, and a great human being, Tony Dungy. Now, Tony Dungy is being painted as a hate monger and a bigot, especially by the likes of a... Uh, uh, USA Today reporter by the name of Christine Brennan, and they're going after him because he made a very honest comment about how he would not, as a head coach, have drafted Michael Sam, an avowed homosexual. I think that Tony Dungy has been a real gentleman. I think he's been a gentleman that's been honest about his religious convictions and what he believes in, and they're trying to demonize him. What are your thoughts? Well, they are, and even... Um, um Reporters here in the Indianapolis Star are doing the same thing. It's um, you know it all comes back to uh, this political correctness that everybody's trying to drive across the country, and that we you know everybody should have freedom to do what they want. And and it's sad um, that they don't stop and, and sit back and say, okay, you know that's fine if uh, if person gay and that's their choice, that's their choice. But if this is a coach and he chooses to only. Uh, draft or hire certain people, that's his choice too. I mean, that freedom of choice goes both ways, and none of them want to talk about that. Well, I just think that they've taken a man like Tony Dungy that has written many books. He's a great family man, a great coach. People respect him. They turn to him when there's been trouble and turmoil, and he has been on the side of common sense. And to demonize this kind of a man, and all the aspects of the news media are after him right now, I find that to be very low class. Well, it is, and that's what I'm saying is that, you know, if you're, if you're going to advocate free choice on one side, then you ought to advocate free choice on the other side. And uh, for them to do that is, is, is unconscionable. They, you know, if, if, if it's truly as they say, it's a free country and everybody ought to have their own free choice, fine. Absolutely. On both sides of the issue, and you can't condemn somebody if they're on the other side of the issue. Absolutely. Dave Vigo is uh, a great author, a fantastic businessman, and a dear friend. And I do look forward to the day when we can sit down and I can finally hand you in person. I think it's beyond a bottle. Probably I'll have uh, FedEx deliver a case of wine. But uh, I do look forward to that, and I certainly wish you God's blessings. Thanks, Dave, for being on the program. Well, thanks, and I look forward to a case also. See you later, Jeff. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. What a guy. Dave Bego, back in Indianapolis, Indiana. Really appreciate him coming on the program this morning. Holy smokes, we got to pay some bills. Jerome County Fair, they're getting all ready. They're getting all ready to try to have that pig wrestling contest. Holy smokes. I mean, they really get people turning out for the pig wrestling contest. That's going to be at 7 p.m. August 8th right there in the Depew Rodeo Arena. They take this stuff seriously and they've got huge parades this year at 5 p.m. on August 5th and then of course the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association Rodeo coming in and then they've got lawnmower races, they've got dairy shows, swine shows, horse shows you know what, they have a lot of fun over at the Jerome County Fair and Rodeo in Jerome and uh, you got to get over there and take part in it over 30,000 of your closest friends go every year to the Jerome County Fair and Rodeo, you better go there too, okay? 
Hey, by the way, too, I want to remind everybody about Let's Ride, Highway 24 between Rupert and Burley. Oh, my goodness sakes. They've got it all for you, all the ATVs. I mean, open the front door of the showroom and just stand there and look left to right, right to left, down the center. Holy buckets, they've got them all. And they've got the new 2015 models that are arriving right now, the dirt bikes, the can-ams, the side-by-sides, and they've got rebates on a lot of the 2014 models, and they've got generators, they've got a fantastic service department, they got all the accessories. Wow! What are you waiting for? Let's ride Highway 24 between Rupert and Burley. Yup, that is where the fun is sold. You get on over there and enjoy. In just a moment, we're going to have Michelle Matthews with the Times News on our program talking about history, and she really does know a lot about history on the board of directors for the Twin Falls Museum. We'll talk to her in just a moment. By the way, did you hear that? You didn't hear that? Hear what? Well, see, that's the problem. You're missing things. Do not ignore hearing loss. Mm -mm, it's not an age problem, and it's not normal. And you better have your hearing checked, and there may be answers to help your hearing. All you have to do is get a hold of Mount Harrison Audiology and Hearing Aids. This is a lovely lady, Christine Pickup. She is a doctor of audiology, and she's located. Now, listen closely to what I'm about to tell you. You. 1218 9th Street, Unit 2, right behind the Minidoka Hospital, across from the emergency room. You can't miss it. You can't. And you shouldn't. You should go over there for a hearing test today. Call her 312-0957. 312-0957. Oh, my goodness, it's going to be a joy to hear what you might be missing. Mount Harrison Audiology and Hearing Aids, Christine Pickup, 312-0957. Really a nice lady. We had her on the program yesterday, and we look forward to having her on the show again. I'll guarantee you she does know what she's talking about. Oh, by the way, I know somebody else that knows what they're talking about, and that's Cameron and Siemens Insurance. Dean Cameron, Todd Siemens, life insurance, health insurance, retirement planning, employee benefits. All these are important, and all of those items you need to address. Don't put it off. Don't put it on the back burner. Don't walk away from it and say, well, maybe tomorrow. No, do it today. Call them at 436-4424. 436-4424. Cameron and Siemens Insurance, Highway 24 in Rupert. All right, let's go to the phone lines right now. Hopefully she's on the phone and we say, you know, this is kind of funny. She lives less than 500 yards probably across the alfalfa field from me. And we had to make a call all the way to Twin Falls to catch her. Good morning, Michelle Matthews. How are you? Oh, good morning, Seth. I'm doing well. Okay. You know, here we, we had originally planned to have her in my studio, and she had to go to a meeting, and so we're doing this via the phone. Give us a little background about you, Michelle. I mean, you're on the board of directors for the Twin Falls Museum on Highway 30 between Filer and Twin. What basically does that mean that you do for the museum? Well, um, I was the director for 40 years. Uh, from 2009 until about a year ago, and I'm now on the board of directors. Uh, my work there led me, you know, really into a path that was I, I wouldn't have dreamed, I think. Um, the history of this area is incredibly interesting, mm -hmm. and it just it just doesn't end. I, it's, it's like if I could be in college all the time, you know, I would, I would love it, and, and that's that's what this is. It's just a constant learning. All right. Now, when you say it's a constant learning, let me ask you this. Do we as a state, do we as a local entity, Magic Valley and all the schools, do we really respect and appreciate the history that went through here hundreds of years ago? Are they teaching this? Are we really making a concentrated effort to preserve it and understand it? Well, I think, I think we are... Um, we are getting better about that now. Um, you know, I grew up in Burley, and in the fourth grade for Idaho history, I remember learning about the historians that came, that went west. Um, but no one ever told us that they they actually floated down the Snake River right here. Um, and one of the most important things happened 
at Cauldron Lynn uh, was the, uh, uh, which party was that? That was the, uh, oh, the, the, the historians when they went down the mm-hmm. Wilson Price Hunt, sorry. Right. Uh, Wilson Price Hunt party as they floated down the Snake River, hit uh, the rapids as the river drops into the Snake River Canyon. They had no way of knowing that they were the first white people, you know, through through this area. Right. And um, one man was killed, and it diverted, you know, they were not able to float the river all the way, so they had to get out and walk all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and that was a huge deal. That was the beginning of written history here in, uh, you know, west of the Mississippi. And, um, you know, it wasn't even taught here. Really? You know, (laughs) when I came here back in 1969, uh, the roots of this area, Hanson, Murtaugh, Kimberly, Twin Falls, going towards Glens Ferry, Bliss, etc. I mean, the roots of the Oregon Trail and all the people that were uh, moving on to Oregon and perhaps starting and establishing farms and ranches, all the families, all the history, everything that was left, left along the way. Holy cow! Michelle, this is big. It, it really is, and you know, there's a lot, um, there's a lot of backstory to it. Um, the originals, the people that came here in southern Idaho, were mostly cattlemen um, that actually settled here. As you can imagine, if you're coming through Idaho in 1830, there was nothing here yeah. for it to stay. Uh, I mean, it was sagebrush and desert. Uh, water, especially here in the Twin Falls County area, was, uh, what, 400 foot down right. the river. Right. And there was, there was nothing that, that made people stay. This was only somewhere to pass through on, on the way to somewhere else. Well, let me interrupt you right there. Let me interrupt you for a second, Michelle, and pardon my rudeness. It was only a place to pass through. Boy, I mean, that one would have been like hell on earth because of no water and grazing would have been limited because of somebody else possibly going ahead of you under dry circumstances like it is right now. How in the world did they survive during those times that they had to pass through this area in midsummer? That, you know, um, that's a big one, and it's a big question. We have a lot of diaries, uh, you know, written by the immigrants as they pass through. Um, you know, another thing before I forget, I do want to mention that, that Casia County, I believe, has more pioneer trails than any other county in the United States. Holy cow. Um, Casia County has the Oregon Trail, California Trail, the Mormon Trail. Um, right. You know, various, various cutoffs, um, and and so it it is. It has the notoriety of, of having more trails than any other county in in the U.S. Now, when you say that has more trails, Michelle, are these trails being preserved, or are they like a lot of things? People just go home home and they don't care. You know, the the National Park Service is actually. Um, rules over this stuff and they have 64 segments of the Oregon Trail that they are looking at preserving. Um, they have already preserved quite a few. Now one of those is on the BLM site there uh, just east of Milner, the Milner Dam, uh-huh. uh, what, what's called the Milner Rut. Now that is one of the, you know, an example of probably some of the best preserved ruts you know, in the whole immigrant trail system. Right. Um, so, but they continually, the National Park Service continually looks and examines the feasibility of of saving other segments of this, just like that, so that we do, so, you know, we, we do. It's part of our heritage. It's how we got here, and, and it is very important. On the other hand, there's other people that, you know, they don't care. And um, so there's always a battle. Yeah. You know, let me ask you this, um, and I do know a little bit about the Oregon Trail and about the migration to the West, etc., and they didn't, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but they, being the pioneers, they didn't really follow the same trail all the time because they couldn't. I mean, the first ones out in the spring from St. Joe, Missouri, or anywhere through that area, they were the ones that got the lush forage and, and all the grass, and others had to divert and be 
basically start their own trail uh, to make sure their livestock got fed. So there must be a whole bunch of trails out there. Were there not? Yes, there were. There were many alternatives to the Oregon Trail. Um, uh, for example, some of them, there's called the Goodale Cutoff that goes through um, Wyoming, uh, a little north of the of the Standard Trail. Okay. Uh, and it goes, actually, they go through these um, uh, Craters of the Moon area. Oh, my. You know, it, it, and so that was, their choice was, gee, this path looks a lot shorter. Yeah. Well, but when they find that they took the shorter path, it was certainly uh, much, much more dangerous. It was terrible on their wagons. It would just eat through the wheels. Um, you know, so they, they would have to learn from other people's mistakes. How in the world could anyone, without scouting ahead and finding that devastation of the craters of the moon and the lava rocks, and like you said, just chew the wheels and their feet and, and the hooves of the cattle, everything, how in the world could they make a decision to try to cross that, especially in the summertime? That would be absolutely a killer. It, it would, it would. Now, through, through this area, they pretty well stayed... Um, pretty well stay to the same map be or the same route because they they weren't taking the shortest way you have to think like the pioneer they were going from water supply to water supply yeah really so you know when you when they got to the snake river canyon there by milner they had to leave because they had to leave that the the river and go south because they couldn't get to the you know you can't get to the water down in the in the canyon right Past there, so when they left there, they crossed Dry Creek near Milner, and then headed south-ish, you know, around uh, back the backside of the Hanson Butte area, right. and came to Rock Creek, which, where um, the Stricker Ranch is now located. Now I want to ask you. A very um, wooded area. It gave them good respite, um, but they could only travel, you know, from from uh, water hole to water hole. Yeah. Let me ask you a little bit. It's if, connect, connecting the dots. Basically. If I can interrupt you there and ask you a question right there about Stricker and the Stricker Ranch, uh, that is absolutely interesting to me. How did they, the family or the organizing unit of the Stricker Ranch, how did they decide that would be the focal point for them to set up kind of a way station and kind of a resupply station and that type of thing? Give us the background on that well, place. Yeah, uh, Stricker is, came a little bit later. It was more at the turn of the century, uh, later in the 1800s. Um, what happened there was this was a regular stop on the Oregon Trail. It was uh, it was a natural place to stop. Um, then when the when the Intercontinental Railroad was finished, then you had people coming from the east going west on the rails and they would stop at a little town called Kelton, Utah. Uh -huh. At Kelton, which is just north of the Salt Lake, they would get off of the train and catch a stagecoach which would take them up, you know, up into southern, let's see, southeastern, well, southern Idaho um, and into, let's see, the first stop there was the city of Rock, mm -hmm. and there was a stage stop there. Oh, boy. Uh, and that's, uh, let's see, so then, then on through Oakley, and around the uh, the northern side of the South Hills. Right. And then it would stop there at at the, uh, what, what became Stricker. This is part of uh, Ben Holiday's mail route. Uh -huh. It's what started this, and it just happened to, to intersect with the Oregon Trail. Uh, I see. So it really wasn't Stricker's that decided that. It was uh, it was actually Stricker's in-laws um, that were part of Ben Holiday's uh, bunch, you know, that went ahead of, of the stagecoaches and found, located 
these places to put home stations. All right. Now, I'm sure, Michelle, that uh, back in those days that uh, all these home stations, as you call them, they had Wi-Fi. They probably had hot and cold running water, showers. They had uh, remote control television sets, king-size beds. I'm sure they had a lot of the social amenities that the travelers needed, right? You bet. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, when they came to Stricker, they would, the ones that would stay longer, you know, were people maybe with, with sick family members that needed to stop. Um, there's been, there were several people that died there and are buried outside of Stricker. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, Stricker really was a, a huge, um, you know, a, it was the place to be. I mean, it was... The, the original store uh, that was built by James Baskin mm -hmm. was the first store, or first building, between Fort Hall and uh, Fort Boise. I see. I see. And so, so this was the only stop uh, along the Oregon Trail once, you know, more people were coming that way right. um, on the trail. It was the only stop between Fort Hall and Fort Boise. We have a caller with a question, Michelle, and then after the caller and you respond, I've got to take a short 60-second break for a weather forecast. So, caller, go ahead real fast. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, Zab, it's not a question. It's a comment. We went across on a wagon train from Fort Hall to Anderson Ranch Reservoir, and we had uh, dropped down through and behind the craters of the moon and down over where the three-lane highway is going up the hill. We drop right back down over the hill there, and you can see all around the lava bed there where the, the uh, wagons had gone and, and eroded the uh, lava rock. Wow. We had six-inch liquid dust. Mm. When we were driving the wagons, you could see one horse, but you could not see the other horse because of the dust. Wow. It was 70 miles shorter to Fort Boise. But it was a dry route, so therefore it was very much more demanding than the other one. Absolutely. Doc, I appreciate that information. Thank you so much. Michelle, I'm going to ask your indulgence for 60 seconds. I've got a weather forecast, and then I want to come back and talk about the supplies and that type of thing at Strickers and other way stations. Stand by. I'll be right back with you. The weather this hour is brought to you by Sportsman's Warehouse, 10, 1940 Bridgeview Boulevard in Twin Falls with my buddy, Reese Widmeyer. Oh, my goodness. It's the great indoors for those who love the great outdoors. They've got everything in there, quality gear, down-home attitude. Hunting, fishing, archery, camping, boating, ATV equipment, everything you need to have fun outside. Absolutely. Sportsman's Warehouse, 1940 Bridgeview Boulevard in Twin Falls. And now here is Michael Rogers Weather. Hey, good morning, Zeb. Temperature is in Murtaugh right now in about the low 60s. You've got rain in your forecast for today, and it's going to get a cooling off period with some rain, too, so you're going to get a break. Uh, slight chance of uh, showers and thunderstorms for today and tonight. You get some rain for tomorrow, for sure. And then you'll taper off tomorrow night and sun come back out on Thursday. you got to some nice weekends very towards the end of the week. Big time highs, how about the middle 80s? How about 85 for a high today? 87 for the high tomorrow. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the weather. Enjoy the weather you've got. Thank you. Michael, appreciate that. Sportsman's Warehouse bringing you the Michael Rogers weather this hour. 1940 Bridgeview Boulevard in Twin Falls. We're on the air with Michelle Matthews, and she's a board member of the Twin Falls Historical Museum and has written a lot of articles about history in the past right here in southern Idaho. And I don't want to beleaguer the fact, but I think it would be interesting, Michelle, when these people hit Stricker Ranch and Stricker Cabin, what kind of supplies were ready for sale for them. I mean, how did Strickers get the supplies, and what was available to these people? Mm, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, you know, there were uh, the most of the supplies would come from from the Kelton, Utah area. I see. Uh, that was the closest way to get them there. I see. So I don't think that they had, you know, that that. Strickers, you know, had difficulty finding, getting those supplies. I see. Um, that was their, their business. In fact, Herman Stricker was a, a merchant um, and was, you know, had that expertise from, he, he had a, a store uh, for the miners even before 
even before the cattlemen and, and stuff came to the area. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they actually had, he actually supplied the Chinese with opium. Uh, it was one of the, the things, there was an opium den there. Um, but the usuals were, uh, you know, bacon, flour, sugar, right. uh, the staples. You know, I would, I would imagine, Michelle, that uh, the number one worry, and of course, now I'm just making a supposition here, but I've read a lot about the history books. The number one worry was with various diseases that could be incurred along any route, like the Oregon Trail, California Trail, etc., uh, and, and the dangers of hygiene, uh, bad water, etc. Uh, what was the number one worry while they were coming through this area? Oh, you know, actually, probably the most dangerous part of the of the trip was the crossing at Three Island Crossing, really? going across the Snake River there by Glen Ferry. Oh, that probably took the lives of more immigrants than anything. Really, I, I don't know how how well known that is, but uh, there a huge percent of the people that tried to cross there died doing it. What was the reason? I mean, did they scope it out? Did they check it out? Did they scout it out? Did they have uh, uh, the wherewithal and the knowledge on how to cross the rivers? What made that crossing so dangerous? Well, you know, they they used to reenact that crossing for right. years and years right. until until modern times now, where where they uh, actually lost horses. So even in modern times, they you know it's dangerous. Um, the crossing, the water, um, there, are, there are islands there in the river, so they were just, they figured it was a natural place to go across the river because they could go from the shore to the first island, right. you know, at breath, get to the next island and break it, break the crossing, you know, up into several segments. Um, it's unpredictable. It's, it's, it's dangerous. And there were a lot of them that turned south and didn't cross the Snake River there. I see. It, went farther south and then met up on the other side of Fort Boise um, and, and avoided the Snake River altogether. You know, Michelle, I've only got a couple of minutes left and I want you to elaborate on this. I would imagine that as a historian and a person that really enjoys studying what happened years and years ago, you have to be impressed with their toughness. You have to be impressed with their ingenuity. You have to be impressed with really the kind of people that would make that kind of a trek. You know, the, the funny thing is, it just shows how we've all gotten soft now. Yeah. You know, this was the normal. Things were tough back then, no matter where you lived. And we look back on it thinking, man, those must be tough people. They all had to be tough back in those days. Right. Um, and, and, you know, especially on a trail. But, um, you know, when, when it's all you know, it, it, you just do what you have to do. Yeah. You know, but uh, they were usually on the Oregon Trail for, what, about three and a half months. Wasn't that the given time to try to make it to yeah, the... Uh... I would say four, yeah. Okay. Four months. And really, they didn't have they didn't have uh, a lot of staples of life extra other than food that they could carry in the wagon or on themselves, water, uh, very little change of clothing, etc. They had to basically live off the land, did they not? Um, they're moving pretty quick, so they're not going to do. I mean, you know, traveling, so they're not going to be doing much living off the land except for you know, maybe shooting a rabbit or a deer along the way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, mo there, it, it was extremely difficult that way. Uh-huh. Well, I want... Um, I want you to come back in the future, and uh, I'll keep in touch with you on this as we uh, kind of study this. But there are so many areas. I want to get back to what you said in the beginning real quick. Uh, there's so many areas of history right here in southern Idaho that people don't appreciate. I honestly think we need to do a lot more with our schools and teach them the value of what happened right here. Yeah, I, I agree. It was uh, very evident when I started at the museum, when kids would come to visit, they were extremely interested in things that happened locally. But when you start out teaching kids history, uh, you know, of George Washington, you know, a man they've never met, or, 
you know, in an area that they've never been to, um, it really doesn't penetrate. They right. really need to start with the local, the local history, and I think, I think you'd see a change in how. Uh, in the appreciation of it. Absolutely. Michelle Matthews, I want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on our program. And uh, I'll be in touch and we'll have you back on this program regarding the Oregon Trail and other areas of history here in southern Idaho. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You bet. And thanks for reading, Seth. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, nice, nice lady right there. And uh, she's my neighbor, Michelle Matthews. And uh, we're going to have more on history on the Oregon Trail, more on the history of what happened here in southern Idaho. And in just a few minutes, that's why I did this segment right before Dr. History with Dr. Ken Turner. It all rolls together because Dr. Ken Turner and Dr. History uh, the same man. Uh, we put together these uh, radio broadcasts every week at 10.06 uh, with Dr. History, and you can re-listen to those. And he delves into this type of thing with the Oregon Trail and the California Trail and what happened with Strickers and everything. But I wanted to create, here's a historian and a lady that is a former curator and on the board of the uh, Twin Falls Museum. Uh, and then Dr. History gets on and gives us stories of that time. I mean, this is really interesting stuff right here in southern Idaho. Okay? Hey, lease furniture, floors, and more. Don't forget they've got all the Simmons mattresses. Oh my goodness sakes, they've got all the bedroom sets. Get a good night's sleep. Just kind of throw back the sheet and say, oh, oh. Time for some rest. Let all your worries go and get a good night's sleep. And they've got all the floor coverings. They've got all the carpet. They've got dining room sets so the whole family can sit together, eat together, visit together. Gee, what a novel idea. And all the living room sets, all the recliners, they've got it all for you. At least furniture, floors, and more at 459 Overland in Burley. You, you, stop in there and see those good folks today. Really. Really a great store. Oh my, and you know what else is going on in Burley? All the merchants are getting ready for the great big Cache County Fair and Pro Rodeo. And some of the merchants that are helping say, come on to Burley and come on to the fair are AMI, 1719 Overland Avenue in Burley. Look for the big 28-foot wrench over the door and go nuts over their bolts. They're the meat and potatoes business, and they're serving you at AMI. Stop in and see them today. Beauty Irrigation, 116 South, 600 West, Highway 27 in Paul and the new location on Kimberly Road, north of Kimberly by Red Cap Corner. Butte Irrigation is a major hub for agriculture, irrigation, parts, and equipment. They will get you wet. Butte Irrigation. And don't forget to Burley Veterinary Hospital. Dr. Wally Ward and Scott Morley working on small and large animals. And believe me, they always serve what's in the best interest of their patients. Their furry and hairy little four-legged friends always there serving you at Burley Veterinary Hospital, 2869 Overland in Burley. And those are just some great businesses that are urging you to be a part of the Cassia County Fair and Pro Rodeo for 2014. Really nice people. Woo! Let's see what else have we got. How would you like to be on a whale watch boat, Gina, and you get about 50 miles off the coast, and all of a sudden the motor gets entangled in some old fishing line, and what you thought was going to be a three-hour tour turns into an overnight stay 15 hours on the ocean? Yeah, I'd say thanks for no thanks. I heard that on ABC at the top of the hour, and that would not be my bag. Deanne and I were on a whale watch boat. And listen to the boat. It was nothing more than an inflatable raft. It only took eight people. And I didn't know that was going to be the size of the boat when we bought the tickets. I didn't know that they were going to go way out in the ocean. I didn't know when until I turned around and asked the guide. I said very nonchalantly, I said, in all the years of guiding for whale watching, have you ever had a whale come up under the boat and tip it over and she said yes in 1998, and I said, take me back to shore. <laughs> 
That is too funny. That is too funny. And Deanne was sitting there as white as a ghost, and then all of a sudden I'm leaning on the side of this little raft, and all of a sudden I feel something, and there is a dolphin swimming alongside, bumping my hand, and I think I'm, my laundry bill went up 25 quarters. <laughs> She's gone. Okay. Uh, no, I'm here, but that, I, I, I couldn't do it. I, I don't think I could go on a whale watch. I've been out on, you know, open sea, like out in the ocean, but I don't think that I could, in a little dingy uh, inflatable boat, no. It was a little bitty, you said it best, little bitty dingy kind of a inflatable yeah. boat type thing. And when I said, it's very serious, I turned around to the lady and I said, by the way, um, <clears throat> I've never done this before. Have you ever had a whale just basically come up underneath the rack? Well, yeah, that's why you wear those life rat or preservers, because back in 90, whatever. And I sat there and I said, please take me back to shore. <laughs> Did you turn three states of white? There's a lot of things I turned. <laughs> I, I bet, I bet. Anyway, we got to go to the news. I'll be back in six. Don't go away. Oh, my. Here we go. Hour number three is up at the ranch on a Tuesday, the last Tuesday of July for 2014. Holy smokes. Oh, it's going so fast. Hey, before we go any further, I want to remind you that uh, Zeb at the Ranch brought to you by our major sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations serving you, along with some of our great advertisers, including Lease Furniture Floors and More at 459 Overland in Berlin, and our friends at Western Way Services, always at your disposal. Get on the route service today. Call Kelly and the crew, 734-6969. Hey, quickly, before we go with Dr. I want to remind you about the Chadwick Sports Grill, 139 West Main in Burley. They've got my sandwiches today, and I can't get down there. Eat one for me. Oh, they've got brat sandwiches. I love brat sandwiches. Oh, my goodness. I was born in Wisconsin. We love brats. they got brat sandwiches on rye bread with choice of potatoes, super salad, just eight ninety five. I love brats. That's great. At the Chadwick Sports Grill, 139 West Main in Burley. And remember. I love brats. That's really, really good. Um, and then don't forget to Harris Plumbing NG. Yes, for all your plumbing service needs, one call, that's all. 431-8633. These are excellent people, and I am very impressed, very impressed. The job is done right, efficiently, respectfully, professionally. You will appreciate that. Harris Plumbing NG, for all your plumbing service needs, again the number, 431-8633. Eight six three three. The best serving you. Well, heck's sake, here we go. The best serving everybody. Here he is, and his name is Dr. Ken Turner, better known all over the world as Dr. History. Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. How are you doing this morning? Hey, I don't know if you were listening. You should have been because we're going to have an oral exam on this right now. Uh, but last hour I had Michelle Matthews on from the Times News, and, you know, they had some recent stories about the Oregon Trail and everything and about the ruts and all the, the stricker cabins and everything else. And the reason I put her on right before you is the fact that you personalize everything. You go into these stories and put names with faces and verbiage about what happened and everything, and you do a fantastic job with history, that's why we call you Dr. History. Well, to me, it's, uh, history is the individual person, you know, their stories. That's what, to me, brings it alive. You know, when I can read somebody's journal or diary, uh, that's what is fascinating to me. Absolutely. That's, that's why I enjoy that part of it. Well, now, what are we going to talk about today? <laughs> Well, I'm going to talk about the life of a soldier on the western frontier. Oh, boy. Now, you know, most people picture uh, the uh, Indians attacking the wagon train, and you hear the bugle sound, and here comes the cavalry to save the day, and sometimes they did, and sometimes they didn't. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, we're just going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, kind of the Indian wars, you know, back and forth between the Indians and, and the cavalry, and... Uh, you know, in the, in the struggle to subdue the Indians, the U.S. military had a lot of advantages over its opponents. Now, unlike the Indians, who were accustomed to pretty loosely organized, small-scale small fighting, 
Uh, the soldiers fought as a group under the direction of trained officers. Uh, Army warfare strategies were used and sophisticated and effective methods. Uh, and experience showed that a force of a trained and well-equipped soldier uh, uh, army could usually win a battle, mm-hmm. yeah, even if it was uh, pretty much outnumbered. Uh, now, enhancing the Army's advantage was its uh, superior communication technology. Uh, they actually had use of the telegraph when the incident didn't cut the telegraph line, and also they used an instrument called a heliograph. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of a heliograph, Zeb. No. Uh, I hadn't. But, so I checked in, uh, what it is, and basically it's an instrument that is a series of mirrors and he uses sunlight, and there's a way that they can move some type of a shutter system to turn this off and on, off and on, and thereby they can send signals from, say, one uh, hill to the next hill. Uh, so they had a couple of methods of communication that the Indians didn't have. You know, I, I did yeah. see that. Uh, uh, hold on just a minute, Dr. History. Uh, I did see that on a movie one time. I believe it was in a John Wayne movie that uh, it's a series of mirrors and they could flash uh, kind of a Morse code type thing to the other soldiers. Isn't that what you're talking about? Right, exactly. Okay. I, I tried to find a picture of one and I haven't found one yet. But uh, And as I mentioned, you know, these were highly sophisticated, uh, trained uh, soldiers uh, going against the Indians, which, you know, except for Sitting Bull, uh, who they claimed they thought that maybe he had some specific training in military uh, warfare because of what he did with Custer. Uh, but basically, they were not well trained like the, like the military were. Now, another advantage the Army had over the Indians was its manpower in the field. Uh, the military could usually call up reinforcements. The Indians didn't have these reserves. Uh, furthermore, the Army's relative abundance of men meant that military leaders could afford to make some uh, somewhat riskier moves. Uh, as can be attested by our good friend, uh, 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 Mr. Custer. Uh, but the Indians, you know, losing warriors in battle meant a significant reduction in hunters and fighters for the tribe. Now, the Army could always recruit more soldiers, but, you know, it would take an Indian tribe a generation to replace lost warriors. In fact, uh, you know, when they, had, when they had intertribal battles, a lot of times there was a lot of shooting going on, but not a lot of hitting. And uh, so uh, the Indians really didn't have a lot of casualties when they fought each other. Again, because um, most of the tribes were very small tribes, and so to lose even one or two uh, warriors also meant that you were losing some hunters for the tribes. So, right. But the Army also had the clear advantage of modern weapons, as opposed to the Indians, bows and arrows, of course. And even when they had guns, the Indians tended to have old models that were not very accurate. They were slower to reload. And in addition, in addition, the guns they had were in poor condition, and they had neither the parts nor the knowledge uh, how to repair them. And the Indians were also uh, less skilled in using firearms because because they usually didn't have much ammunition. They didn't practice. They didn't uh, do any target shooting. Mm-hmm. So they tended to shoot their rifles uh, randomly at soldiers at point blank range in the midst of the battle. And the army rifles, they were more accurate at a longer range. And uh, so the soldiers were trained in distance shooting, so they were able to keep the Indians back far enough that uh, they couldn't really return fire very well. Now, if heavier firepower was required, a detachment could take uh, Gatling guns or howitzers into the field, and the armory also had uh, access to supplies, including ammunition. Uh, In fact, again, we refer back to General Custer and... You know, he had these things, but they were too far behind him to, to do any good. So the Indians had a few advantages of their own, uh, however. Uh, the troops were trained in conventional warfare, uh, but they were ill-prepared to deal with the Indians, which usually used kind of a hit-and-run tactic. Right. And the Indians exploited that weakness for many years until the Army kind of adapted to what they were doing. So the Indians usually knew the land much better than soldiers, too. Uh, the Apache, for example, had thrived for generations in the deserts and the Rocky Mountain uh, terrain of the Southwest. And this was pretty tough for the uh, soldiers. They, they weren't used to fighting that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of them had actually come out of the uh, Civil War service and from back east. 
Now, several key strategies employed by the military were instrumental in winning the Indian War. Now, the main offensive tactic as uh, strategy, uh, almost as old as war itself, was the surprise attack. Mm -hmm. uh, while the attackers could take their time putting themselves in position, and uh, of course the startled defenders had to scramble to fight or, or get away, uh, catching the enemy unaware and unprepared was very often enough to win a fight, uh, regardless of how many people you had. Uh, in the Indian Wars, though, a surprise attack usually meant striking a village, which inevitably resulted in the death of women, children, and old people. Right. Now, unfortunately, the Army considered this just a, kind of an unfortunate but acceptable by, byproduct of doing battle. In fact, uh, again, referring back to General George Custer, uh, I'm going to quote him. He says, well, he says, the Indian women are as dangerous as adversaries as the warriors, and he said the Indian boys, 10 to 15 years of age, are found to be as expert and determined in the use of the pistol and the bow and arrow as the older warriors. So again, they rationalized that it was okay to kill the women and the children, unfortunately. Now, one effective Indian fighting technique that incorporated the element of surprise was winter warfare. Uh, because most campaigns took place in the spring, summer, and the fall, when travel was the easiest, winter attacks were generally not expected by the Indians. So under the harsh conditions of winter, Indians on the plains were nearly immobilized and pretty much unable to wage war against the other tribes. So everybody just assumed among the Indians that the white soldiers were also immobilized. And so the Indian winter camps were usually uh, unprotected and pretty easy prey for the soldiers. Um, but again, like I say, the Indian tribes, they just figured you know, nobody's gonna fight during the winter. Now, while winter campaigns were brutal for both sides, the Indians were particularly vulnerable. I mean, game and berries were scarce in the winter, so the Indians had to rely on their what they'd stored in food supplies, which usually re depleted fairly rapidly in the, as the winter months passed. Soldiers, on the other hand, were generally, now not always, uh, well supplied with food and other necessities throughout the winter. Mm -hmm. Now, also scarce in the winter was grass for the horses. As you know, the Indian ponies, They'd send it on forage. They'd just, uh, you know, use their hooves. You've seen horses do this, that, where they just, you know, uh, plow through the snow to get to the grass underneath. But uh, on the other hand, these soldiers, uh, they had grain-fed horses that stayed pretty strong. Mm -hmm. and again, that was not always the case, because uh, sometimes the soldiers didn't get the grain or the hay that, that they were needing for their horses. Now, another advantage the Army capitalized on was its mobility. During a surprise attack on the village that was buried in the snow, the Indians could not easily get away. So in order to escape, the Indians had to move their entire winter camp, which included the women, the children, the old people, horses, dogs, teepees, food supplies. And conversely, the pursuing soldiers had to carry only a few items. All right. Uh, and again, they had the support of uh, wagons uh, behind them that had all their supplies. So they were able to move a lot faster. Now, though they were better equipped to deal with the challenges of winter warfare than their native counterparts, uh, soldiers also suffered during this winter campaigns on the Great Plains. Uh, I mean, they had storms and frigid temperatures, uh, just like the Indians. The men faced frostbite, hypothermia. I mean, horses and mules died in fierce blizzards. Uh, they became stranded in the snow. Now, in spite of the difficulties, these army strategists considered the winter months a good time to attack. and. Indeed, some of the most important and successful campaigns were uh, taking place during the wintertime. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, kind of an interesting tactic the Indians learned as they went along here. Because of their inability to fight in the winter, some of the tribes learned to open peace negotiations with the whites in the fall. Uh, and perhaps even going back to their reservation for the winter. Uh, and then in the spring, they start raiding again. Oh, my. And... Uh, this is not something unusual. I mean, the Indians had treaties broken time and time again, and so for them to go in the fall, meet with the soldiers, and say, okay, we'll sign a treaty with you guys, we'll be good. Uh, so during the winter, they'd sit on the reservation, they'd gather up ammunition, food, whatever they needed, and then in the spring, they'd just take off and go out and uh, start doing what they did. Mm -hmm. So, But uh, the Army kind of caught on to this and eventually they uh, realized that that wasn't, uh, wasn't working for them. So part of the Army's strategy in attacking, in attacking the villages, whether in winter or summer, was to destroy the Indians' shelter and food supplies. 
uh, capture, kill the horses and kill, capture or drive away all the Indians. And whatever Indians survived uh, the initial attack, they were exposed to the elements and often starved uh, or died of exposure. And this, uh, this tactic was called total warfare. Now, the doctrine of total war uh, kind of discarded the conventional warfare uh, rules uh, because flags of truce were not recognized, women and children were killed, and all their possessions were just totally destroyed. Uh, Zebra, you still there? Yeah, I'm just sitting here. I'm infatuated, and, and I'm scared to interrupt you. I'm actually calling from Boise, and I'm uh, on my cell phone, so I'm hoping that all that you were coming through okay. Yeah, the, the main thing is we've got to make sure on future broadcasts that we don't use a cell phone. That's not a good tool for these rebroadcasts, so we want to try to stay with a landline. Right, and I apologize for that today. It was kind of a all I had to, uh, to use today so well, anyway uh, again like I said the, uh, uh, the, the the soldiers would pretty well destroy everything that the Indians had right uh, when they would attack a village teepees were uh, they would use some for their wounded men but uh, really there must have been tons of dried buffalo meat and uh, saddles bridles various robes and everything that was destroyed in fact, one soldier told of, uh, he said uh, when they destroyed things, there was 418 uh, animals were captured, 10,000 pounds of dried meat, 84 lodges complete, uh, 1,000 buffalo robes, 78 rifles and revolvers, and large quantities of supplies that were completely destroyed. And you know, as a historian, I think of all those relics, Indian relics that were destroyed. And, you know, we do have some great samples in some of the museums but again I think of all the things that were lost and destroyed and burned let me ask you a question there doc hold on just a second um, when you talk about these Indian camps and I know you've probably studied this but I have never read did they have like certain areas or certain teepees or certain shelters that they devoted just to the keeping and storage of food you know, that's a great question, and I can't really say that I know the answer to that. I Just from my understanding, I my understanding is that each uh, Indian with his family basically stored up what they needed for the winter. I don't know that they had a common area for storage. Now, maybe they did for, well, I was going to say Buffalo Rose, but even that, I think they probably just kept their own. Mm -hmm. That's just a guess on that. Okay. So... But anyway, uh, when you think about the Great Plains, they were pretty much dominated by the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Comanche, and the Kiowa. And before 1850, it wasn't too bad. Uh, there was a few settlers and a few gold prospectors that roamed out west, and the Plains Indians just really didn't pay much attention to them. They didn't harass them much. But by the mid-century, uh, more and more travelers were making the trek westward, and then again, thousands of fortune seekers took off for California gold fields uh, uh, after the gold strike at Sutter's Mill. And, and then families in search of better life, they headed for the fertile farmlands up in Oregon. And so obviously with the rapid increase of white men along, the, uh, along with the establishment of forts and the arrival of the Overland stage, well, the Indians started to get a little worried because they realized what this invasion really meant. Right. And a major worry for them was that, uh, you know, all the game would be driven away or killed, leaving them with really no source of food. And they feared that they would be re reduced to beggars, uh, existing on government subsidies. And so to drive these strangers off their traditional hunting grounds and ranges, the Indians started raiding settlements and killing the white people. And so for the next 40 years, it brought a succession of skirmishes and broken treaties uh, before the Plains tribes were finally placed on reservations. So, again, we've talked about this, Zeb, that, uh, you know, the Indians were leaving, living a life that they uh, considered was their land, their animals, the buffalo, the deer, the elk, and here come the white people just invading their grounds. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, just briefly, I know we're about out of time, about some of the uh, major players in the Old West in the military. Okay. Uh, there are some pretty prominent military men who came out of this. 
William Tecumseh Sherman mm -hmm. became commander in chief of the entire army in 1869. That's right. Now another guy that was uh, a standout was uh, Philip Henry Sheridan. Mm -hmm. uh, when Sh uh, Sherman retired, Sheridan became the general in chief of the army. Now another guy that stands out is uh, uh, Alfred Howe Terry, and of course he was involved in the Battle of the Little Bighorn uh, with Custer. And then there was another guy that also was involved in that, uh, George Crook. And they say that he was probably the greatest Indian fighter of his time. Uh, he fought Indians in Idaho, Oregon, Arizona, just all over the West. And in fact, Crook was the one that finally forced Geronimo's surrender. And of course, we can't go too much farther without talking about uh, our friend General George Armstrong Custer. And... Uh, you know, to his credit, he was a national hero. And, uh, of course, he met his fate at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Yeah, but you can also you, you can also say about General George Custer that uh, you can graduate last in your class and still fail. That's right. <laughs> yes. Uh, you could say he had a bit of an ego situation. A bit, yes. Uh, in fact, we've talked about that. He claims that... With his 7th Cavalry, he could take out uh, any uh, group of Indians, no matter how big. And, of course, uh, that came to an end at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. That's right. And uh, uh, along with uh, uh, 210 of his men, he was age 36 at the time. That, uh, now, not as well known as Custer, but kind of a major player in the Indian Wars was Nelson Miles. Mm -hmm. And this guy was... Uh, he was in the Civil War as a captain. He distinguished himself. Uh, he was promoted to Major General. And after the war, he uh, helped in the South. But uh, anyway, uh, this uh, Miles, uh, he battled Crazy Horse and took part in the pursuit of Sitting Bull after the Battle of the Little, Little Big Horn. And he also helped with the imprisonment and surrender of Geronimo. Uh, he also... Unfortunately, was involved with the death of Sitting Bull at the massacre at Wounded Knee. Yep. So those are just a few of the major players. Uh, you know, here in southern Idaho, uh, there's General Connor, um, you know, which Connor Creek over there by Albin and Elma, Elba is named after. So there's another, uh, a few of the major players in the uh, war against the Indians that uh, played a major part in getting them to finally surrender and, and go to the reservation. Okay, now i tell you what, real quick, I've only got a minute left here. Uh, I want to remind everybody that if you'd like to hear one of the podcasts, go ahead and, and tune in to uh, dr-history.com, dr-history.com, and uh, a lot of broadcasts heard all over the world. Give us a quick plug on that. I've only got 30 seconds left. dr-history.com. Tell your friends and neighbors and anybody, family, that... You know, if they want to hear these stories, uh, we've enjoyed putting them on for the last few years, and now there's about 15 or 20 stories on our webpage, and we're heard throughout the world, and uh, we would like to, if you like our stories, please tune in to Dr. and then put the little dash, history. Com. There you go. Uh, God bless, and we'll talk to you next week at the same time. Dr. History, better known as Dr. Ken Turner, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it, and have a safe trip back home. You have a good day, Jeff. Thank you, sir. Uh, my favorite guy right there as far as coming on the radio and sharing all the history with us, and that's Dr. History. And don't forget, dr-history.com. You can listen to those programs anytime you want. Thank you very much. Hey, before we go any further, sugar bee growers, don't forget, introducing Preaxor from BASF, the newest form of chemistry for sugar beets to fight disease and potentially increase yield and sugar content for your sugar beets. Preaxor contains headline and a new compound, Xenium, that also provides excellent control of powdery mildew. Like I said, with the application of BASF's Preaxor 45 to 60 days prior to harvest, you have the potential of higher yields and more sugar content in your sugar beets. Well, you'd better contact your local ag chemical supplier today. For more information, call BASF Ron Ellis at 431-6776 or Tim Perry at 844-0682. Remember, BASF's Preaxor for your better sugar beets. 
Oh my, we're going to take a little break right now, and uh, then we're going to come back in just a moment with more of our guests. We're going to be talking to Daniel Simmons with the Institute of Energy Research. I want to remind you on Thursdays we have a program called School Days in Cache County. It's brought to you by A Child's World at 1308 Overland and Burley and the Ambulatory Surgery Center. <clears throat> Don't forget at the Child's World, all the clothing, all the shoes, all the games, everything, all the presents for birthdays, everything is gift wrap free, you're going to love it. Child's World, 1308 Overland in Burley. And then don't forget to the Ambulatory Surgery Center. For a long time, Burley has had a surgery center to save the area and patients thousands and thousands of dollars. Why don't you give them a call today? They're located at 1344 Highland Drive in Burley. Their number is 677-8888. Ambulatory Surgery Center and a Child's World bringing you School days in Cache County. Right now it's time for a break at the bottom of the hour. We'll be right back. And now back to Zeb at the ranch on AM 1230 KBAR. To reach Zeb, call 436-2244 or toll free 1-866-927-4587. And now here is Zeb Beth. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome back. And uh, we are blessed to have with us on the phone line right now a gentleman that's been on this program many, many times in the past, director for the State and Regulatory Affairs of the Institute of Energy Research, Daniel Simmons. Daniel, good morning. How are you? Yeah. Good morning, Zeb. How are you? Well, I just do not understand uh, this current situation with coal. I'm going to relate to you, and then I want you to tell me where I'm going wrong. I'm looking at a bunch of hypocrites. I'm looking at a bunch of liars. I'm looking at a bunch of phonies involved in this Obama administration, basically selling our coal to other countries of the world so that they can burn the coal, they can have more efficient energy programs, but we in this country say, oh, no, we don't want to contribute to the phoniness of global warming, but they can. This is idiocy. <laughs> well, I mean, your, your first problem is here, Zeb, is, is being rational. Um, that, 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 that's where you've gone astray. Oh. Um, the, uh, I mean, it, it, it's as simple as that. The, you know, there is a, uh, the U.S. has, has started in, uh, exporting more coal, and the reason is is because the U.S. is one of the largest coal producers in the world. In fact, only China produces more coal than us. Um, the U.S. has the, the most, the, the largest reserves of coal of any country in the world, including China. I mean, we have more than anyone else. We could be the number one producer, but, you know, the, the problem is is that the Obama administration is waging a war on affordable energy. Um, much of that is a, is a war on coal. And uh, as a result, it's becoming harder and harder to, to use coal here in the United States. So these people that are producing it, they're like, well, you know, if... If the feds won't let us, you know, use the coal right here, produce low-cost electricity, produce dirt-cheap, reliable electricity, we're going to ship it overseas because at least those, uh, you know, people in, in other countries realize that coal makes affordable, reliable uh, electricity and said we're, we want to, you know, depend on the sun or depend on the wind. You know, Daniel... I, I'm just at the end of my rope. Uh, I get on this program every day, and I try to tell the folks honestly what's going on. But when you look at an energy program that isn't, we don't have an energy program. We have nothing but just pie in the sky, green stupidity with Obama. Where are we going to make up? Tell me this. Where are we going to make up the 40% of power that coal generates for our society? Where is it going to come from? Somebody's little flag windmill in the back? Backyard. I mean, this is ridiculous. It is ridiculous, and that and that right there is the problem. Coal produces forty percent of the electricity generated in this country, and the Obama administration is trying to, you know, essentially reduce that to zero. But it's actually even worse than that, because not only you know they're going after coal, but they're also going after natural gas. It is obviously the next, you know, the next thing. So. And you know, and and uh, you know, natural gas produces thirty percent of the of the electricity generation in this country. So they're they're really going after a huge part of 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 our you know of 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 the energy that we use. And you know, as as you asked, well, you know, where are we going to replace that? Well, we can't replace it. Um, 
you know, you could replace a lot of it with natural gas over time, but that just means we're going to be paying more for natural gas. When we're paying more for natural gas, it means that we're going to, I mean, for, for power plants, it means that we're going to be facing high electricity prices. We're going to be paying more for natural gas that we use in our homes. And we're also going to, uh, you know, we, we've experienced a, 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 a boom in manufacturing in this, in this country in large part because we have cheap natural gas. So we do away with one of our biggest advantages that we have in the world economy, which is dirt cheap natural gas here in America, all in a, you know, all in an effort to, uh, you know, to, to attack coal. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense, but, you know, the... the well, it, but it's just that right there. It doesn't make any sense. So the fact that you don't understand it just means that your head is screwed on right. Where are the people uh, sending the outcries to Washington? Where are the electric car owners with the common sense that God gave a billy goat that they can't see that they're not going to be able to plug their car in and get the power? They're not going to have their coffee maker. They're not going to have their toaster. They're not going to be able to watch the Super Bowl. They're not going to be able to listen to the radio, God forbid. And they're not going to be able to do anything because we're not going to have the power. These green energy companies are not making enough power to even go, what, 2 to 3% of our power needs? What's going to happen to us as a nation? Well, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to take it on the chin. We're going to be, you know, the first thing that's going to happen if, if a lot of these coal-fired power plants go away is we're going to see much higher electricity prices. And that's just, you know, that's just crazy. I mean, if you look around the world at, at what other countries are doing, and I, I hate to admit this, I mean, you look at a country like China, and China, what their government says is, hey, you know what? You know what we need to grow our economy? We need electricity. Right. Um, in, right. Over the last, um, you know, just uh, actually over the last 10 years, China in some of the major cities has gone from like only 5% of the people having a refrigerator to 95% of the people having a refrigerator because they realize that, hey, you know what? This stuff makes our life better. And instead, in the White House, so we have, you know, the Chinese that are out there saying, hey, energy is good. That's why we're going to burn a lot of coal. We're going to be producing you know, affordable, reliable energy for our citizens. And then in the Obama White House, they're so detached from reality. And not only that, they don't even care about reality. They want to live in some fantasy world where they can just dream up, you know, they can, you know, I don't know, fairies produce the energy or something like that, as opposed to be, you know, living in a real world where real, you know, where you actually have to produce electricity. This is what happens when you have a president that is just, you know, that is completely checked out and that would rather go golf all day as opposed to, you know, out how to make America a superpower once again. You know, Daniel, when you look at it overall, let's just take a uh, husband and wife that are retired. Are they, and they're on a fixed income, are they going to have to pick and choose whether to maybe turn on their furnace or turn on their pellet stove or maybe turn on their refrigerator or maybe turn on their oven? I mean, it's going to get to the point where you're going to have to pick and choose and live like a caveman and hermitage yourself to the point where you're not going to have any of the amenities to enjoy your life. So, you know, a couple of things about what you said. First of all, you know, when you talk about pellet stoves, EPA is going after those two. They're going after wood-burning stoves. Um, so, you know, that's something to, that's something to keep an, an eye on. Now, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop, Daniel. When you say they're going after, be more specific and more uh, explanatory. What do you mean they're going okay. after them? Uh, EPA has, you know, some recent regulations for wood-burning stoves that are very hard to meet. And uh, what that means is that if, you know, if you're going to be buying new wood stoves, I mean, hopefully you do it sooner rather than later, because, you know, before long, the wood stoves that we've had for years and that are, you know, that have worked great for us are going to be essentially illegal under, under EPA's, you know, new regulations because of, uh, you know, even, even your home wood-burning stove will have to have certain pollution control technologies on it. It doesn't matter if you live in the middle of nowhere where it doesn't matter one iota. They will still have to have, you know, EPA's approved pollution control technology. So I sure hope that people can be able to build their own stoves in the future to get around this kind of crap coming from, from EPA. What about pellet stoves? Real quick, we have a call. What about pellet stoves? We, we have a call. Uh, I want to ask you, but I want to find out. What about pellet stoves? How in the world could they ever be regulated by the EPA? They're the cleanest source, aren't they, of heat? 
Well, yeah, but I mean, the the, the problem is, is that the, there are, um, in, in EPA's eyes, is that there is some pollution. There are, some, you know, what smoke is. Is smoke is, uh, you know, part of what you see is particulate matter, and EPA goes after that like, you know, like the plague. Oh my! We have a caller with a question. Quickly, caller, go ahead, please. Yes, the other day I was watching PBS on Sunday, and they were breaching a dam in Oregon. And there was an earthen dam, and uh, they were helping the water to uh, break the dam open by letting it flow over the top. And we all know what happens with that. Uh, the, the, all that earth, rock, silt, is going to be flushed down the river. And, and, and that kind of thing is, is the very thing that they say is not to be allowed ever. But these hypocritical, you know what? get away with it because they can and they were all you know so happy about it but that river will never be the same in that area for i don't know how long and they get away with their own hypocrisy and this insanity and then they want to breach dams on the snake river over here four of them that produce power and then the insanity of these people is, is, is not to be believed and i'll just hang up you know i think he kind of summed it up best right there daniel when he said the insanity of these people is not to be believed isn't that the truth with these people in the epa all the way to the oval office they're nuts it's it's true. Idaho has, and you know, this, this is a very important point. Idaho has some of the cheapest electricity in the country. That's right. And you know, a large a large reason for that is because of hydroelectric power. You know, power from existing hydroelectric dams. Um, and uh, you know, the only states that ever compete with with Idaho for having the cheapest power are Oregon and Washington. Well, duh, more hydroelectric power. And I mean, it's. When you, when you take the low-cost existing sources of power and you throw them away, whether it's, you know, you take down dams or you, you know, you close, you know, existing coal-fired power plants, the only direction that you're going to see your, your, your electricity bill go is, is straight up. Um, and it is, it's, it's just a sad reality. And so when the Obama administration starts, you know, starts dealing with their friends in the press to try to, you know, to, uh, to start their attack on coal exports, it's, it isn't really an attack on coal exports. What it is is it's continuing their attack on coal, which is an, an attack on affordable, reliable energy. Daniel, I'm going to ask you a favor to just stay on the line with me. I've got to do a quick one-minute commercial with our weather forecast. I'll be right with you. Scales meets 331 North Road, Jerome, bringing you the weather. Michael Rogers weather this hour, 324-7657. The best in meats and meat processing for over 20 years. Scarrow's Meats, one bite at a time. They're selling taste, and they want you to enjoy it. 324-7657, their number. Here now, MichaelRogersWeather.com. Hey, good morning, Zeb. Temperatures in Murtaugh right now in about the low 60s. You've got rain in your forecast for today, and it's going to get a cooling off period with some rain, too, so you're going to get a break. Uh, slight chance of uh, showers and thunderstorms for today and tonight. You get some rain for tomorrow, for sure. And then you'll taper off tomorrow night and the sun's come back out on Thursday. you got to do a nice weekend as you very toward the end of the week. Big time highs, how about the middle 80s? How about 85 for a high today? 87 for the high tomorrow. Enjoy the day, enjoy the weather, and the weather you got. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Scarrows Meats bringing you the hour, uh, weather this hour, 331 North Road, Jerome, 324-7657. Scarrows Meats selling taste one bite at a time. We're on the air with Daniel Simmons with the Institute of Energy Research. I want to read a paragraph, if I could, Daniel, out of a newspaper story from a couple of days ago. And this sums it up as to where we're headed for energy or lack of in this country. It said, quote, it's a planet hungry for American coal. U.S. exports to Germany have more than doubled since 2008, providing a cheaper alternative to cleaner burning natural gas and a replacement for nuclear power, which is being phased out after Japan's nuclear accident. So in other words, we're sending energy over to Europe, over to Germany. They tried this incompetency and this idiocy with wind power and solar power, didn't work, wasn't cost effective. We couldn't learn from their mistakes because we're not bright enough in this country. And we're selling energy to everybody else to live a better life but us. This is totally stupid. 
It is. Um, and one of the things that Germans have realized is that, I mean, there was a great article a while ago in uh, their newspaper called Der Spiegel, which is no, you know, this is not like a right-wing publication. It is definitely left of center. That, but ask the, the simple question, is electricity becoming a luxury good? Electricity prices in, uh, in Germany are about 36 cents a kilowatt hour. In, uh, in, in Idaho, they're less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. I mean, they're, they're more than three times as expensive. Why? Because of, you know, because they're trying to, uh, to produce a lot of electricity from renewables like wind and solar. As a result, they've had higher electricity bills, and they're starting to have to import coal from us just to keep the lights on. I mean, that is, that is just sheer insanity. Daniel, is there, and we've talked about this before, but is there any way we can stop this man? Is there any way we can stop this administration? Is there any way we can restore a balance of common uh, sense into this country with an energy program that's going to benefit us? I don't want to live in a cave and burn buffalo dung. Is there anything we can do? The only, you know, the only thing that we can do is to, you know, well, is, is, is a couple of things every chance we get to tell the administration that they're full of it. But also, you know, our, our elected officials have to stand up. And, you know, they haven't done a good enough job of that, that so far. Um, but, you know, our, our, you know our, our, senators, our senators, our representatives in Washington have to fight as hard as they possibly can to, you know, to raise these, these issues. Because the Obama administration does not care about a growing economy. That's not one of their issues. What they care about is reducing greenhouse gas emissions at any cost. And you see that um, in the regulations. And so our elected officials have to stand up. We have to stand up. It's, you know, it, it, it's ridiculous that, that we have to make this point, but we have to make it time and time and time and time again and, you know, tell people, hey, guys, the economy matters. It matters whether or not I, you know, whether or not we will be able to afford energy in the future. We have to leave a world for our children where we're not so cash strapped that we could actually, you know, that we could actually grow the economy and that the U.S. can be an economic superpower instead of... Uh, continually uh, putting uh, restrictions about our own, you know, about our own energy and our own power. You know, what an oxymoron, getting our elected officials to stand up and work for us. You've got to be kidding. Yeah, and that's, the, and, that's, and that's been the problem. I mean, for far too long we've had, you know, elected officials that just don't, you know, they talk a good game, and sometimes they talk a good game when they're, when they're in their districts, but they come to Washington, and, and far too often it's, you know, go along to get along, as opposed to, you know, really, really fighting back. And, and, and it isn't, I mean, the reason that we're in the situation that we're in is that over time, over decades, literally, that, you know, the Congress has given away power to the, to the administration. And one of the things that I'm sure that they, you know, that they, that they told themselves was, you know, well, these guys aren't so bad, whether it's the Bush administration or the Clinton administration or the Bush administration, or the Reagan administration. Like, these guys aren't that bad. You know, they're, they're going to make, like, decent choices. But you know what? When you give away your power, it ain't coming back. And there you go. You have an administration like the Obama administration that does not care one lick about the economy, that does not care about keeping the lights on. This is what they can do. And Congress has to take their power back instead of continuing to give it away. Boy, I tell you what, I appreciate your comments, Daniel. we got a fight on our hands, and I'm willing to jump in the ring. I know you are, too. Daniel Simmons, Institute of Energy Research. Thanks for being on the program. Come back soon. Thanks. God bless. Thanks for having me, Zeb. Thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, coming up August 11th through the 16th, the Cache County Fair and Rodeo. And this year, the entertainment on Tuesday, August 12th, is going to be Chris Cagle. What a great country entertainer. This man, absolutely two gold albums and uh, some top 12 charted songs. Woo, this guy is good. Chris Cagle in concert at the Cache County Fair. And don't forget the big rodeo. Don't forget all the exhibits. Don't forget the horse races. Don't forget the excellent entertainment. All the exhibits, all the 4-H, everything at your Cashew County Fair and Rodeo, August 11th through the 16th at the Cashew County Fairgrounds. Gonna be good. You all be there. Oh, by the way, too, I want to remind you about our friends, our major sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations serving you. Let's talk a little bit about tires. Now, they've got all your tires for all your driving 
needs, like the Wildcat AT2, the best for your pickups and your SUVs, all-season traction, smooth, quiet ride. Or how about this one, the Terramax HT? Mm, boy, now there's a tire that'll get the job done for you. You know, all the tires, all the tread designs, all the best in brake service, the very best in shocks and struts and front end alignments and batteries. Boy, they really provide a service of treating your vehicle and you with the best in mind for safety. So you stop in and see them today. And the best in brake service. My goodness sakes, yes. All of this with Lane and Rupert, Dave on Blue Lakes and Twin, Mike and Buell, Mike and Jerome, the Twist family and Paul, John on Pauline and Twin Falls, and Randy on Overland and Burley. Nobody does it better than your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers. You stop in and see them today. Wow, let's take a look at the list for tomorrow. Um, we have uh, the open forum at 8.06 tomorrow morning. And then at 9.06, Doug Johnson calling in from Colorado. Then at 9.30, I thought we'd kind of have a local segment. And this is kind of an interesting business that has gone literally worldwide. Calvin Perkins of a &P, uh, Machinery, and they have put together the bulls, the mechanical bulls that have gone all over the United States and for that matter, the world. And we're going to have him in the studio talking about that. And then we're going to talk about the TSA. And I've had my experiences with the TSA. And we're going to have a gentleman on from back east talking about the, the TSA and how ridiculous it is to try to get through airports. So all of that tomorrow morning on Zebeth Ranch. We'll start the festivities off at 8.06 in the morning and go to 11 right here on KBAR, 12.30 a.m. And then streaming live all over the world, regardless of whether you live here locally or not, you can still listen to the program. Just go to ZebBell.com and you can tune us in and hear everything that we've got on this show. ZebBell.com for Zeb at the Ranch. Okay? And uh, thanks to the lovely Gina Jameson over at our main studios for basically quarterbacking the whole show. Deanne here at the office. And we appreciate it. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 8.06. The way things were are the way things ought to be.